It is six o'clock. Uh oh. <laughs> Recording in progress. It's still six o'clock. So I'd like to call the um, select board meeting to order for the town of Springfield. And our first thing I'd like to do is start off. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone, for that. We'll continue on with roll call starting on my left. In practice, three more guys on. Michael Martin. Christy Morris. Cara Chase. Michael Schnell. Recognizing the absence this evening of Heather Crump. But she's not participating by Zoom, correct? No, she's in Germany. Uh, yeah, I understand. Five hours. So. Yeah. I have to ask. Checking. So the first order of business is to adopt the minutes from the September 9th meeting. Move to accept the minutes of the September 9th select, regular select board meeting. Meeting minutes. Well, I have a second. I hear her second. So we do have a motion and second to improve the minutes of the September 9th draft minute meetings or meeting minutes. Are there any corrections, errors, or omissions noted? All set, Karen? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we hear no corrections, errors, or omissions noted. All those in favor of adopting the minutes as Printed and distributed, signified by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. And they pass in the affirmative 401. Do we have any requested additions to the agenda? Uh, yeah, I have an application for the Budget Advisory Committee. I'd like to add that as item 11. Objection. That means he has to stay till the end, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, good point. Do we know them? No. Uh, without objection, we'll add the uh, BAC application to the agenda as item number 11. Moving on to a new business this evening, we'll start with uh, item number one, which is act on the Northern Gateway Scoping Study. Uh, thank alternative. you. Uh, at the board meeting two weeks ago, the board reviewed the alternatives for the Northern, Northern Gateway entrance. However, the parking situation for each alternative was unclear. As a result, the board asked to have Stan Tech at this meeting to ensure that they understood all the alternatives completely. Israel Maynard, who I believe just joined on Zoom uh, from Stan Tech, is here to clarify the alternatives so that the board can determine the preferred alternative. Again, there is no future commitment tied to this scoping project. I will also note that the town has multiple projects, such as water and sewer line replacement, that will need to happen before this project um, could even be considered. However, the report requires that an alternative be chosen in order for the scoping study to be completed. So I believe Israel is online and Logan, you're here from Mark, right? Okay. Uh, I think Israel, I think the best thing uh, for going forward is just to, if you can quickly summarize the, the three alternatives and and then we can have a little discussion with the board as we go selecting our, uh, our chosen option. Sure. So um, the for, the existing condition for parking, is, as you all know, is, is kind of just like a large informal parking area. Um, it's got approximately 650 feet of frontage, which in an informal condition, a parking space takes up you know, 13 to 15 feet. So it's about 45 to 50 spaces worth of parking in the existing condition, you know, give or take. There, there might be a few spaces that, that would come off just because there's park or uh, utility poles in the way or, or something like that. But generally speaking, around 45 to 50. Um, so alternative one is the al alternative where there's perpendicular parking that's adjacent to the roadway. Um, that parking situation would would uh, result in approximately 47 spaces um, that might go down uh, or up in final design, depending on um, how much more green space we could take up or or if you add a, 
uh, ADA accessible type spaces, that would take away a space or, or spot or two, but generally going to be right around 47 in that perpendicular condition. Um, and then that alternative one, as you all may remember, is the, the shared use path along the river, perpendicular parking along the roadway. Um, the alternative to parking situation um, results in about 40 spaces, and those would be angled parking with a one-way parking aisle. So, so basically that, that whole parking area would circulate in, in a one-way direction, and, and people would pull in perpendicular to the, the retaining wall adjacent to the river. Um, there would not be direct access to the roadway. Everybody would need to, to follow that aisle to, to one of the ends of the, the parking facility. And, and that's, you know, an access management condition just so that we do not have uh, vehicles needing to back over the sidewalk or shared use path. So no, no vehicles crossing that pedestrian area other than the dedicated points at each end of that parking facility. Um, alternative three is a very similar condition um, with, with 40 angled parking spaces. Um, this this alternative, however, has the shared use path adjacent to the river with the with the parking a little closer to the roadway, separated by a green strip, um, which will will delineate that aisle. Um, again, this is an access management condition, um, just so that the the uh, parking stalls don't have direct access to the roadway. And then alternative four, which is very similar to alternative two, except it does not reconstruct that parking area. Uh, that parking area would remain informal and just be um, just just have access management so that it's it's kind of closed off except for access on both ends of the parking area. Where's the walkway on that access? On alternative four. Israel, did you hear the question? Where, uh, Israel? Yep. Yeah. Where, so where, for where alternative the four, the the walkway would be directly adjacent to the roadway. It's not really clear. So one, two, and three have the walkway along the road. You know, two is along the road. Two is along the road. Two, Mike. two is along yep. the road. Yeah. yeah, two and four are along the road. Okay. Israel. So number four is essentially doing nothing right now. Is that the nothing option? Um, it's not really a nothing option. It just it's the one that stays entirely within existing right away, so it does not impact that private parcel. Um, it would not be reconstructing that parking lot in any way. It's still constructing the shared use path, but not the not the parking area. And it gains, or it gains the, the space by narrowing the lanes. Yes. Yes. And if, if I'm correct, and members can correct me if I am wrong, um, there was a couple of the options that we don't have approval from the owner of the property. And we were a little reluctant to pick one that without having preliminary information. Yeah, I think um, the alternate, alternative, alternates one, two, and three all require easements. An alternate four zone does not require easements. Is that correct, Israel? That is correct. Or we could purchase the property. Right? Well, we could try. I mean, 100 Mercy owns it. We'd have to. Yeah. Yeah. Now, who, who, um, who, who reached out to the owners of the property to discuss the alternatives? Is that something that your company did, Mr. Mayors? Did you know so? So we typically do not engage directly with property owners in the planning phase. Um, that's more of a design. You know, once we get into design and, and have a design, that would be the the appropriate time to, to connect with them. They certainly can be engaged as far as sending them the options, but we don't necessarily start like a right away negotiation into, until design phase. And and Mr. Mobus, who who uh, communicated to us that the owners were not? Oh, I sp I spoke with the owners. You did, yeah, and they weren't inclined. No, they they're concerned about reducing the number of parking spaces, 
which are um, they feel like they don't even have enough now for all their their plans for the their location. So they were not interested in reducing the number of parking spaces. And are those all owned by One Hundred River Street? Because there are some apartments across the street that I think park there. Are yeah. those rented? Um, they're rented. Yeah. So and then um, Mr. Hanley owns the ones closest to the Hanley building. And Mr. Maynard, the six hundred and fifty feet of uh, river frontage did that go all the way from the pedestrian bridge at One Hundred River Street to the Hanley building at the Easterly nope. end. That's the that's essentially from that bridge to their property line. Um, so so the Hanley building parcel does own a portion of that parking lot. So that would only only be to their property line. But your study did not include Hanley property. No. Okay. And Mr. Melvis, is there any way that we could convince the owners of the 100 River Street that it might be in their best interest to alter the traffic pattern to improve the quality of access for their tenants? I mean, I I don't know. I mean, I'm not them, but they, they were very hesitant to lose any parking. Uh, so I'm not sure. I, I We can approach them again, but I don't know if they'd be willing to, to lose somewhere between uh, seven, ten spots. Well, although it's anecdotal, I, I've gone by there a lot of times and, and I haven't ever seen that uh, property fully utilized in the current condition. I, I rarely see any parking past, you know, 100 feet from the bridge. I don't know what anybody else's observation is, but um, I, I guess I would say this about the alternatives. I, I think that as it was proposed to us by the engineers in the original uh, Main Street Master Plan, that um, the idea was to create a river walk. And um, leaving the path along the road is certainly not accomplishing the goals of a river walk. Um, the other thing that we uh, considered in, in this Northern Gateway study was to improve the safety of both cars and pedestrians and uh, leaving the, the pathway along the road with no control over the parking situation certainly doesn't improve the safety aspect of, of this change. So, um, you know, even though, even though it might be difficult to negotiate with the owners of the property, I would think that, um, you know, alternative one or alternative three where we can create a little walk and and improve the safety of the pedestrians as well as uh, uh, improve the access for parking, particularly the one-way alternative, which is uh, I believe number three. Correct? Number three, yeah. Number three is the one-way alternative. That certainly would improve the safety along the road for uh, um, the cars that are parked along the river to gain access to those parking spots and improve the. Uh, the, the, the safety of both the pedestrians and the motor vehicle operators. And I think that was the objective of, of this Northern Gateway study to begin with. I'm, so, I'm, I'm in favor of what you're, you're suggesting. Um, the downtown master plan has been in place longer than the people that own the building. And so that would have been something that they would have been aware of, the intent of that parcel. Anyway. So I think that it makes sense for us to at least attempt to negotiate yeah i'd like to go that route yeah and as mr mobus has pointed out too that there's a considerable amount of infrastructure work that needs to be performed long before this plan can be implemented but we need to close out this contract and we need to choose an alternative yeah. i don't remember what the costing was but i think we have a number here uh, the uh, alternative number three was um, one of the most expensive, um, and that was the one with the one-way access, correct? Correct. And, and number one provides pedestrian uh, safety by putting the path along the river, 
but it leaves uh, perpendicular parking where the uh, people would be backing back out into the street. Mm -hmm. I don't think right. that's an, as far as vehicle use. Great. Yep. I, uh, I, I would think if we're going to uh, achieve the objectives that we laid out in the Main Street Master Plan, that alternative number three would be the one that we would select. That does match the original goal. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's the one. For the discussion from the board, more questions, uh, Mr. Mayor. Now, can I, one other thing, uh, Mr. Maynard, alternative number one preserves the most number of parking spaces, correct? Yes. But it does require that we get an easement to use their land for uh, the, the walking path. Yeah, yeah, there would need to be a bit of a swap here where where you're giving up part of the right of way so that they can park in it um, and they give up part of their properties for the shared use path. Well, for my preference to, to pursue alternative number three, which which is uh, uh, diagonal parking with one way access. Um, that would that would ease uh, congestion along the road, provide safe access for both pedestrians along the river, and also uh, provide uh, uh, easy access in and out for the uh, motor vehicles using that area. If the owners um, are, are against that, I, I, I would I would say that alternative number one might be something that's more palatable to them because it preserves the number of spaces. And at least improves the um, pedestrian experience through that area. So I, I would I would say that it's a it's really subject to negotiation. That's going to be ongoing because this isn't going to happen until until uh, we get the other infrastructure. Yeah, the water and sewer lines. Well, and that's scheduled for what tentatively? Well, you, the sewer line are hoping to get done. In 25, so 20, well, it would be 26. Sorry about that. I should say so. So probably 27 would be the earliest. And really, the water sewer lines are underneath the parking at that point, too. This so you're worried about. Yeah. The existing parking. So, so the existing water sewer lines, yeah. So, so the, for the purposes of our discussion this evening, can we choose um, alternative number three? And that will close out the contract with the uh, Antac. And then we'll work on negotiating with the property owners to see if we can get alternative market three. And if not, we have alternative number one as an option that we can, we can offer. As I, can we talk a little bit about the process? Uh, Israel, you might be able to answer this as well. If, if we were to, sounds like we're looking at alternative three. If, if we, we go forward and approve that alternative. What is the process for the project going forward? And when would the easement uh, information uh, be given out so we could get that back? That, that's preliminary to construction, correct? Correct. Yeah. So in the typical process, um, so you you're, you have your grant application now, or sorry, you have your scoping report now or will have as soon as we close this out that'll that'll be able to be used for grant applications right so to get to get funding um from federal sources if if that's what the town wants to do so if if you go ahead and get a grant based on this scoping report um then design would be initiated and then at, at a point in design, usually um, preliminary design, so we've gone through conceptual plans, then we would get into developing the easement documents and securing right away. Um, if you don't have a federal grant, those things could be done a little bit out of order where you you might negotiate early and and let the property owner know that, hey, we want the whole parcel or we want part of it or we only need 12 feet for an easement and, and kind of negotiate that outside that. But I, I'm assuming... 
I'm assuming you guys will all be trying to go on it, get a grant for this. Um, so that process becomes a little bit different and happens later. Thank you. Yep. Other board members have questions regarding the four alternatives, actually five, if we do no action. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it seems like we're leaning towards alternative three. I think for this phase of the discussion, I would say three is our most desirable, and we should pursue that. And we do have the ability to make changes in a year or so before we have to make a final decision. Yeah, and in your grant application or any grant application, you could give yourself that flexibility to to say, hey, if negotiations are unsuccessful, we would go to option or alternative one in the area of the um, in the area of the parking to to uh, mitigate that for the property owner. But... So I think you were looking for a vote tonight, right, Israel? Yeah, as soon as we can get the vote, um, we can put that in as the recommendation in the report, send that final report to VTrans, and then VTrans will, will close that out. We want to make a motion to get this on the table for discussion. I'll make a motion that we, for the purpose of closing out this portion of the project, uh, select alternative three. Okay. Thank you, members. So we do have a motion and seconded to select alternative number three as a Northern Gateway Stolten Standard Alternative. Do board members have any further discussion on the motion? Are there any comments from the audience? Again, this process is just selecting uh, an alternative for the scoping study from the head of the Main Street or the Hanley building. Will, we've been talking about that up to the plaza area near the uh, VFW. I know some of you may be flying a little blind with the fact that. Uh, you might not have access to information, but I don't know if people have looked at it on the website. We have talked about this previously. Tonight, we're just selecting the alternative. Right. Uh, I move a, forward. I, I have a question. Can I get you to identify yourself? Scott Ballard. Yeah. Um, the concrete walls that are next to the existing walkway that's there now, is that what you're talking about, fixing the infrastructure before you yeah. continue? No, um, we're talking about the water lines and sewer lines. This last March, we had a sewer line break yeah. underneath that parking lot. Okay. So we've cameraed those lot, those sewer lines, and they all have to be replaced from uh, from the pedestrian bridge down to the fork, the intersection across Park Street over to the state building on Mineral Street. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Thank so you know, it's not the and the remaining walls across the street are um, are still in good shape. The your base underneath the sidewalk from the retaining wall over to the plaza. Yes. Those retaining walls will, ha will have to be um, secured. That was my question. Yeah. That's something okay. that's yeah. If you've been to the uh, doctor's office across the river, you can yeah. see very clearly what we're looking at. Right. Thank you. And the state is aware of that infrastructure yeah. deterioration. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions before we vote? Hearing none, seeing none. We'll call up with a roll. Starting on my left, with Mike Martin. Aye. Christy Moore says aye. Tyra Chase. Aye. And Mike Schmidt. Aye. Uh, that is for the affirmative. So approved, recognizing the absence of the head of our report. Okay. Israel, you have uh, some walking orders. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move on to item number two on the agenda, and that is a ban on the firearms discharge in the Hartness Park. And we had a request from Ramona Emery, and she is here this evening. I understand others may want to speak to this, but we'll get the information out. Um, 
Mike Martin is going to explain if we have an ordinance in place for this purpose of the ban of discharge of weapons. Uh, he might just outline the process of how we got to where we are and what can happen going forward, just so everyone is is aware. So, with that said, uh, Ms. Emery, do, uh, do you want an opening statement or explain why you wanted to get on the agenda and why we're here? So, a group of us are circulating a petition to repeal, which I understand has to go to a town wide vote, um, this uh, firearm discharge at Harvest Park. Ms. Robles? Yeah, is that your statement? Is that your? We'll talk more. But uh, what's the date of the uh, effective date of the ordinance? Do you know when? Oh, we, the, the board voted it yeah. on August twelfth. August twelfth. So the petition is due forty four days after that, which is when this Wednesday, so the twenty fifth at five p.m. Wednesday at five p.m. Yeah. If if there is if there is no petition. <clears throat> The ordinance goes into effect 60 days after, so roughly October 12th. <clears throat> if the petition is successful, um, then the the town would have to the board would have to schedule a vote yeah. um, within 60 days of the petition being submitted successfully. Yep. Okay. And so you're saying that petition is due by Wednesday, Wednesday September 25th. Yeah. 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 This one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's do this. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I didn't do the research on the dates, but yes, basically that's um, BSA 24, section 1973 provides for the repeal of an ordinance with a petition of uh, citizens of at least 5% of the voter checklist. And I don't have that number. Do you know what that number is? Um, this morning, uh, when I checked, yeah, it says Monday, um, it was 320. 320. 320, yes. Yeah. So it, when, when you present a petition, um, then we have 60 days to have a special town meeting to vote on. So. How do you warn that? Uh, there's, a, there's requirements for warning it 30 days in advance. Um, the entire um, article, whatever the wording is, has to be approved by the town attorney before it's put into the warning. And then the select board will warn the meeting. And we'll put that in the newspapers as well as uh, the the posting places, library, post offices, town hall, website, and, and that's how it's warned. And and, uh, um, and then in that warning will be the actual wording of the article that will be before the voters. And and so your petition should have that word in essence <laughs> because that's what the petitioners are asking the town to do. So your petition should have that wording that says, this is what we want. And the town attorney will recraft that in the legal language that's required for for, uh, for a uh, town like vote. No, um, that's not accurate. That's not accurate. No, the, the language on the petition, on each page of the petition has to be the language that will be um, the article that will be voted on. We don't. And, we can't change it. Uh, according to statute, the town attorney has to it has to review it. But. Yes, has to be be sure that it it, it fits the conditions in the law. <laughs> so there is so, a legal review. So whoever took out the petition, and I don't know if that was you or um, some others that are in this room, whoever took out that petition should have worked with the town clerk to get the language or to. To understand what the language needed to be, and I don't know if that happened or not. I haven't seen the petition, so I don't know. Um, but whatever is on that petition would be what citizens of Springfield would be voting on if we receive the petition back in by Wednesday with 320 signatures, approximately. Yeah, that was not. Didn't, the people who spoke with the town clerk did not hear that. Um, what she did say, to me anyway, I only spoke with her last week, was that the wording had to be at the top of each page. Yes, um, yeah. but that's the wording we're talking about here. It's, it's, I didn't know that uh, we needed to work with her to establish that wording. 
I actually spoke to her, and that was not what she told me. <laughs> she should have been, what I'm saying is she should have advised you of the process. So you needed to have a statement wording on the petition, and then that would be copied or distributed out to the voters who wanted to sign it, and then that would come back to the town floor with the signatures. Um, I, I, I was hoping that there might be some advice of what that wording. No, no, it obviously has to contain, it can't contain uh, foul language and, you know, all those other things. So I'm sure there was a statement um, on the petition. I wish we had one here. I, I was told that she couldn't help me do it. No, no, the, we cannot help them. Right. You cannot the help content, them. With the content, only the format. You have to misinterpret what I'm saying. It's the process with the language of what needs to be on there, and it's their wording, mm -hmm. but how that gets applied to the top or the heading of the petition, <laughs> and that's what needs to be turned back in at the proper time. I, I would think that she would help facilitate yeah. that process. Well, she tells them that you need to have the, the, the wording on the top of each page. There has to be the sign name, the printed name, the address um, for, for each page. Um, person, and I think that's what I'm trying yeah. to portray. It's the but I think they that of... they're saying what they're hearing is that she helps them with crafting the wording, and she no. does not. No, it's just the it's just the template. Yeah, right. It's the format of, of the petition, and she did go over that. In the attorney review, is yeah, just your name, address. Yeah, she went over that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, the. The, the town wide meeting needs to be called by if the petition deadline is uh, is the 25th, then we have until November 25th to have the town wide meeting and we would have to make a, a, a notice by uh, 30 days in advance, which would be October 25th or thereabouts. So, and we meet again on October 14th. So, um, I would say that we we'll probably take up the issue on October 14th, um, provided that you've got your 320 signatures. There. But there'll be no action tonight. No, I understand that. A question? Uh, I'm a little confused. Can I get you to state your name for the record? Uh, my name is Don Shattuck. Somebody Thank you. Know me. Okay, good. Um, a little confused. You mentioned a town meeting, but this is going to a town wide vote. Same thing. Okay, that's just yeah, no, I, that would be a special town meeting. A special mm -hmm. meeting. Will there also does that also include a hearing to inform the voters on the reason for the revote? Would the town take that responsibility or would the parties um pursuing the petition be responsible for organizing that informative meeting? Good question, huh? Yeah. Uh, I mean, typically, no. typically, uh, uh, the night before our regular town meetings, we have an informational meeting. You know, the March town meeting when we vote on the budgets and understood the, uh, well, yeah, I don't know, Don. We, we, we probably would do something like that. I would hope it would be televised so that if it is a town wide vote, all the facts yeah. and parties are laid out. Yeah. This went through, and, and no surprise, kind of under the radar screen of the majority <laughs> of the citizens in the community. Uh, granted, it was it was warned, it, you know, the letter of the law. But um, again, I think I say for everybody, there's wrong. Um, we're kind of surprised it did go through as fast as it did with as little exchange or publicizing of information about it. And we want to avoid that second time around. So we're looking to have guest speakers. We're looking to have interested parties, um, people that know the history of the park. Um, and also to clarify, is it indeed a town park or is it a town forest? And the other thing I want to clarify, um, how does this influence other town forests or parks? Um, is this a once and done deal or is this a foot in the door to, to uh, ban hunting? You know, and uh, this, how does trapping get involved with this? So we really need to define the usage of mm -hmm. these town properties, both for now and next generations. Okay, so you mentioned a couple of things there that, um, that the ordinance does not do, it does not ban hunting. It bans discharge of firearms. I'm aware of that. But, yeah. yeah, but uh, to not get into it. And and this is specific to Hartness Park. Yeah. 
there, there's no master plan that we that I know. at this time at this time yes it does only hire this but we're looking to define the usages beyond the vote in the meeting have it served as a guideline for future usage of town property and to define the difference between a town park and a town forest well hang, hang on I got a um, question up back there we go Jimmy Ford. Uh, I'm here as a member of the Springfield Trails and Rural Economy Committee, and um, since Mr. Shattuck has aired his concerns, um, I feel it's incumbent on me and on behalf of the several committee members here to at least give some The most basic, there's a very small part of the park where you can legally discharge firearms right now under state law. If you are 500 feet from a house, you are not allowed to discharge a firearm in the state of Vermont. And that's state law. It's, it's the game wardens and, you know, the town is trying to align its laws with state law. You have a tiny little ellipse at the top Backed by Woodbury Road, where you can fire and be backstopped by topography. But apart from that, if you fire a gun, even a 22 or a shotgun, you could lock, have that locked down onto Summer Street or any one of a number of other residential neighborhoods. That was our primary concern when we uh, initiated this. Our secondary concern was the safety of park users. And you raise the distinction between a park and a forest. That's a distinction that we intend to maintain and solidify. It's always been the intention of the committee and re recorded in our discussions that we feel that the town forest, AKA meeting waters down there by uh, five should remain open for others to use and for you know, its current existing usage, but that this, being surrounded by residential neighborhoods on four out of five sides is more appropriate as an area for people who don't want to have firearms discharged around. So, I mean, I, I'm not asking if you agree with that, but does that address some of your concerns? No, it doesn't. Actually, there's some errors there as well. Um, excuse me, Don, if I get yeah. to address the questions oh, okay. forward. Uh, We're not going to get into a debate back and uh, forth. And thank you. Uh, this is why we need the information meeting ahead of time is to define state law regarding discharge of firearms and structures. It would either be a state statute or the option for a homeowner to put up the 500 foot safety zone around his property. And if that is a very distinct difference between those two. Yep. And I don't think there's anyone that is actively hunting that does, hasn't attended a hunter safety course that isn't fully cognizant of the range of a 22 long rifle. Uh, there has been hunting in that park town forest for 90 years without a single incident. Um, there it is, Springfield has forced all around. We're, we're blessed to live in a rural area and most young people, not as much so as generation past, woodchuck hunt, dairy farm, squirrel hunt, all the rest. And there's no incidents. None. Hunter safety courses have pretty much eliminated the accidents that did historically happen through education. So uh, we want to have these meetings. We want to define that, bring in game wardens, fish and game specialists. And we do want to review the laws exactly as they're written and stand and cover public lands. And our, James Hardis gave that land for all Springfield citizens. Okay. And so there's one other question I'd like to address uh, or a thought concern is uh, the quickness of this process. And so we, we had the Springfield uh, Trails and Rural Economy Committee that brought this forward and they had discussions in their meeting. It's a lot like the airport. I know you're part of the airport commission. So you, they have separate meetings. Uh, the, the minutes are taken and they're posted on their website and they're available on, on the town website and select board receive members who receive them in our packets, but so they're available. So that process started a while ago with at that have that conversation. And then it goes to the ordinance committee. 
uh, which is two members, but you can't have three. That's a quorum of, of uh, Mike Martin and uh, Heather Fram. And uh, so they reviewed the information and put forth the ordinance. Now that ordinance comes before the select board. And again, we had the public process. We had the minutes recorded and it gets published in the various places and available. Uh, so that takes a process. And so it may seem like it's quick if you're not privy to the information or weren't aware of the information until the petition was distributed. Yes. I get it. But we have been talking about this for a better part of a year or more. Um, so, I mean, that, that, and I don't know, that's the $64,000 question. How do you get the information out to the public for all the things that are going on in town? If they're not, they're not visiting the website, reading the minutes and understanding the topics or the agenda. If there's something on the agenda uh, that gets posted, uh, should should become public awareness of, of the intent of what we're discussing. So I, I wish I had the answer for that. I, I, have, I have my own family members that don't read Facebook, they don't read the town website, they, they don't, maybe don't visit the library often to, where things get posted. And um, it, it's concerning. Yeah. It's very concerning. And from my view, it isn't just this. It opens the door to small special interest groups being able to leverage that lack of community awareness. Maybe true, but that is unfortunately is. what we are governed by and, and how we're govern, governing. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, uh, and, 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 and by the way, I don't think any select board member is upset with the petition. It just, this is a democratic process. This is how legislation gets crafted, how it gets, a, um, uh, well, I'd say necessarily adopted, but adopted by the board. And then it had, there's certain time frames where the citizens have the opportunity. The petition is being distributed. And, uh, and then if there's enough signatures and it comes back in a timely manner, we'll have a vote and the citizens will decide. Mm -hmm. So that is the democratic process. I don't think any one of us here are, would be upset if this plays out to fruition, and, and this is how, where we end up on November twenty, November twenty fifth, or there or there. Um, so days. Um, I don't know if we've answered concerns, um, questions, or um, or other thoughts. I'm not seeing any hands up, but um, Kurt, I get you to get your name to the hand. Kurt Merriman. Oh. Couple of questions. I, for one, am negligent on not being aware of the agenda. I don't go to the library. I don't go on the website very often. <clears throat> but with social media today, that's the way it is in this world. And you see a lot on the Facebook pages here in Springfield. My recommendation would be and is uh, that the select board move to post. The agenda on those social media pages. Some people are on there all day long. If I had seen it, I'd be I'd have been there. I did not see it. No fault of you all. That's on me. I didn't go to the right place. I didn't even know there was such a thing going on. So that is something I would hope that you would do for all parties. And you know, you can get into a the contest on there with residents. My recommendation would be is on the Facebook page that from the town select board, town manager, town clerk, puts that item on Facebook that nobody can comment because you're going to have a lot of one. Let it be posted. If they want to talk about it on another site, okay, but that's not to be a say. Put it on there. Let the people talk. That's my too. Whichever, whichever y'all think that would work. Um, I, for one, am in my 79th year, and I hunted that area. Part is part. Part is part. With one of my best friends, I even had one for 50 years. 50 years. Never had an incident. Nope. We've driven it. We've hunted independently. We've had it in two and three. We as hunters 
know exactly what Don just said. We know about the 500 foot barrier. We know where not to point our guns. I think the well, hunters were pretty safe. And for someone to try and deprive us of hunting in that mm -hmm. area, and I'm not talking about just deer, yes. there's yeah. hunting goes year round, 12 months a year of some sort. So, that being said, there's a long time warning, Fred Vermont. He could have told them to the hunters. Now, the people that want to walk in the park, <laughs> uh, you know, be respectful of the hunting times. There's other places to walk. <laughs> hunters, if you're boarding there, uh, people start to walk, be respectful. Let them know we're here. But unless you live in a hole in the ground, well, everybody knows when hunting season is. Thank you very much for your time. Yep. Thanks. Um, and the questions on the process. I think, I think we tried to lay out how how we got here, why we got here, and the process for going forward uh, to answer the question of the petition, when the ask be brought back in, and when the possible vote would be. Um, are there any questions regarding the, the process? Uh, just to, uh, one more time, just to clarify, it, the petition goes through with the signatures we have, which shouldn't be a problem. Um, the meeting I spoke about, the informational meeting, who's re whose responsibility is that? That's a good question. And, and uh, Mike Martin uh, made mention of the fact that on a, on our um, annual town meeting, we have the public informational meeting on the Monday night before the vote. Uh, I'm assuming it's not specified in statute. It's not specified, but I'm assuming we would want to do something to, not only for people to speak out, but for um, this board to explain exactly why we're, why we're doing it. Exactly. So hearing both sides. The why, just what we did here tonight. Think of yeah. why we did it and, uh, and how we got here and what needs to happen. I can't thank you enough to find this is a democratic process, and I think the meeting, a dual forum saying this is the procedure for repealing any ordinance in the community. It's democracy in action. And just to answer another question, and I don't want to cross any lines here, but I'm, I'm a candidate for another office, correct? <laughs> Most people know that. It's up to me to get my information out. Uh, it's up for me to advertise uh, my candidacy, uh, and it, it's it's uh, it, I I have to take the steps to do that so people know that I'm running for an office or or, or what that goes. So uh, my reason for saying that is the petitioners should also help to inform your reasoning on the various platforms. Uh, that you could you could do campaign signs, you could do Facebook or other social media postings uh, to get it to get the word out to you. Because I, I can tell you right now, in years past, we we advertise, advertise, advertise the best way we can, and you end up with sixteen hundred votes out of six thousand uh, people. For one reason or another, they, they aren't interested. Think their vote doesn't matter. I don't know what it is, but. We've got to get the message out. And I think that responsibility could come from, certainly from the petitioners to get their information out. And, and uh, what, what is our responsibility? Do we do, we do a, a public meeting on, say we vote on a Tuesday, do we do a Monday evening? Well, um, there's no requirement for the for an informational meeting to be the night before. I mean, I, I've been trying, you know, talking to Barbara, moving informational meetings earlier because there's absentee voting. So by the time you've had the informational meeting, uh, a large number of people have already voted um, via, via the mail. So I, I think it'd be nice to have an informational meeting early enough so that when, they, when things go out, when, when ballots go out, that people are already have had the information to make uh, an enlightened decision. That's a great, great point, Joe. 
Mike Martin. Yeah, four years ago, we um, we decided that we would uh, uh, put our town charter up for adoption. The Secretary of State allowed us to add it to their ballot, yeah, so that we could have it uh, uh, decided at the general election in 2020. Mm -hmm. And of course, to get it onto their ballot, they would allow us one article and they would do it for free, but we had to get it done by August 28th or 29th or something like that was the deadline. However, that was just to avoid us having to print a ballot. Um, if, if we decided to do this on November 7th, we would have to warn it by October 7th. November 5th. November 5th, excuse me, November 5th. We have to warn it by the, by the October 5th, 30 days warning. And that means we have to, to, to scurry a little bit to get these things uh, uh, approved and adopted. Yeah, I'm not even sure you could make the date. Um, I saw the but, but there's nothing that prevents us from having a combination. Uh, legally, no. I think it, it, we could we could warn our meeting for the same date as a general election. You could. Um, Barbara is very against that. I'm sure she is. Yeah. No, she suggested it would probably be November 12th or 19th. I it was the dates in November. And that's a consistent with a two. It is because two separate, it'd be two separate um, yeah. checklists, two separate votes, different places on the machine, different machines that collect the votes and everything. So it would be some hurdles. Not right. insurmount. It would be two separate checklists. Yes. Yeah. Because you have to tally what happens to the tabulators for the general election. <laughs> and then like me, unless you put more time into it to have the ballots programmed, you're not going to be able to have a tabulator program for it. So those ones will have to get hand counted. So you'll have to have a check this to say who's voting in that election. We couldn't reprogram our tabulators to include No, the state ballot. has already sent it. Already done. It's already happened. Because absentee ballots are already actually in process of being sent out now. Hmm. Today. So the tabulators are already programmed yes. for the ballot. Yes. So this would be a hand count? Yes. But the checklist would be different? Yeah. Well, it would be the same checklist, but you have to have one separate because you have to have the totals match what comes through the machine to what came through the people going to vote. And then you'd have to have ones to match how many hand counted ballots you got. It's easier to have them separate than it is to have them together. Because you can't use a tabulator. Yeah, that ballot's already done. Yeah. Also, for the warnings, we'd have to post it. And our paper of record is the shop is the shop. It's printed weekly on Wednesdays. You have to get the information to them the Friday before, and this would have to be out thirty days before the vote. And I'm not sure we'd e we'd even be able to make that date. Mm -hmm. Doug Johnson. Doug Johnson. When did, uh, why is such a rush to get it into, uh, I think you're talking about the November election, why couldn't we do this at the uh, the annual uh, budget for the town vote for the budget? I would think that would give an opportunity for both sides to take a look and get the information out so you can educate the public and it would, wouldn't be a cost of an additional election to the town. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I understand that, but uh, uh, I think Mike's going to yeah. speak. You know, the statute's pretty clear. Yeah. Once we receive the petition, we have 60 days. That's the that's the clock gets started. Once so we receive a valid petition, we have 60 days. Can I ask a question? Uh, yeah, and after Jeff Moses, you wanted to answer. Uh, well, I was going to say that also if you wait till March, the ban would be in effect this year. No deer season. For, for deer season this year. Uh, Ramon. So moving forward, how do you um, receive opposition from voters, um, taxpayers in the town? I know that in the uh, shopper, the summer meeting, um, you were quoted as saying that there was a huge outcry on social media about this. But yet when I wrote to you, I was ignored except by a very wonderful gentleman who explained it out to me 
and said that I was the only voice of opposition. I never hunted for a minute in my life. I don't even shoot guns. We don't hunt, um, but we walk there. And I suddenly became very afraid with this unfounded fear that I could be in grave danger and my dog could be in grave danger. And I've walked there for almost a dozen years. And I had to start realizing that this is, um, it's a big issue. You know, the hunters are losing their public land. And that's what I've learned from them. And they hunt more up toward the Maple Dell. They're not hunting on the trails. I'm not sure the state, it, the law is only 500 feet, but again, I'm not a hunter, I don't know guns. But you said that you know, there was an outcry on social media, and then you said that I was the only voice of opposition. And I wonder if I couldn't hear what Kurt said, because I have terrible allergies to the weeds that are out right now, but um, I wonder if you might start posting on the Springfield Town page and then just disable the comments. You know, this is this, and then folks could, you know, I haven't got involved in this, and it's been kind of willy-nilly, honestly, because people were saying this isn't right, and it doesn't feel right, it feels wrong. So I just wonder how we could I, I, have people know. I, I think I explained that process. and So it would uh, be at the library, at the... It, on the town the website. Um, I would... I, I would I, I wish when people voted I could tell them have you checked the town website to see who your departments are who you de who who the people are what, what legislation is coming through what the agendas are and speaking about social media which one do you use uh, there's Facebook there's TikTok there's uh, Instagram there there's all these different platforms that various people uh, associate with. And so, and I know happenings is one that uh, is uh, receives a lot of um, posting of information and comments. Uh, I know that's just one. Uh, um, so, so getting that information, it's a problem. Get the information out. Mm -hmm. To answer your other, to address your other question about, um, I, nobody has contacted me to sign the petition. So I'm not aware. I know people are getting the petition out there, and I see there's a room full of people here tonight. So, so I know that uh, there's people that are speaking to the petition. And if I haven't heard that personally, um, I, how, can I, how can I address that or answer to that? Um, it, this is a democratic process and how it plays out. Um, it, we, we've had the Trails Committee, we've had the, uh, the Ordinance Committee, both posting information on the website and the, the various places on the agendas. Um, I I can't make that horse drink water. Um, put the old the old adage, you know, I can lead him to water, but I can't make him drink. Gary, you get, I, you're I just want me. to say one thing about social Jessica, media. Jessica, I'll get to you in a second. Facebook is that like non biased happenings around Springfield, the happenings in Springfield. Those are all private pages. They're run by private people. It's not run by the town or hosted by the town. So if you really want information, we, the town does have a, a web That's a Facebook I'm, page, yeah. But the town but, can't but, shut the comments off. Uh, no, please, but please so, be frank. You, know, you just also have to remember that there is ability for people to create all these communities and have all this information out there, but you really need to go to the source, which would be the town's Facebook page, not the community pages. And that's what I meant, yeah. the town well, yeah. page. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yep, I'm going to cut it off, and I'm going to let Jessica Martin speak. She's the only one that hasn't spoken, and, and you can wrap it up. Thanks. Jessica, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had a question. I don't, I don't know if Carrie or the select board might be able to answer this, but what's the approximate cost entailed in a special revote? And who foots the bill for that? 22,000, 2,200. It's a fair amount because yeah. we have to pay the school for the use of the building and their staffing and then the election workers that come to it and yeah and any notification that the right. papers etc right. ads advertising and yeah, yeah. so is 2000 low or 2000 i think it's low i think it's, your, I think between, it's low. I think you're between 3 and 5000 
figuring how many mailings you have to do for um for FC ballots and everything. Right. You can add oh, up yeah. And all then you've good. got all the envelopes for those and all yeah. the paper. Thank you. Thank you. So um yeah, uh, good conversation tonight. Um great audience participation. Glad that you're all here learning a little bit more about how we do things. Um Vermont is a unique state in uh, uh, that it has this open meeting law. It's the first state in the union to, to require municipalities to provide all the dialogue, all the discussion, all of the uh, uh, items that they consider, including our legislature, in open session. And the public is always in, entitled to come in, to any of our meetings, as well as uh, our committee and, and commissions that, that, that support us. Uh, all of these things are prescribed by statute in terms of what they are required to do in terms of notifications. It's somewhat archaic, you know, post offices and town uh, and hall lobbies. And, and there is one newspaper. We have to designate a newspaper. Um, we, we, we used to use the Springfield Reporter. Now we use uh, the Shopper because the reporter doesn't meet the classification of a printed newspaper. It's online only now. You know, so we use the shopper. Um, you know, who reads these things? Um, you mentioned social media, and, and, and I know that there's a, a, a lot of people that get a lot of information off of social media. Um, we do have a, a, a Facebook page for the town, but you don't see it unless you follow it. So even if we put it on Facebook, doesn't guarantee that anybody's going to see it. You know, and that's the problem with all of these things. You know, um, the chairman's right. We, we start this process in open session and we continue to talk about it in open session. If the newspapers or nobody picks up on it, then, you know, nobody knows about it. Right? And um, I don't I don't know how you do anything differently, but the state does prescribe uh, the requirements that we are required to follow in order to inform people. And that's what we do. Um, they don't have Facebook as one of their requirements, but we certainly can start adding more announcements on our Facebook page. And maybe somebody will follow us and maybe they will see it and share it and go from there. But so so right now, uh, Wednesday is your deadline, five o'clock, 320 signatures. Um I'm I'm hearing that we don't have to jump through hoops to to do a November 7th general election ballot because we can't do it anyway. So uh, we'll probably take up the petition on the 14th. 5th. November 5th, yeah. Um, That's right. And November, October 14th, because our deadline for posting would be uh, uh, October 25th, and that would make it 60 days uh, from the date of the petition. And um, as far as the informational meeting, yeah, I think it's probably a good idea to have an information meeting, and we can pick it any time we want, I guess, huh? Um, I'd like to work with you doing that, as I'm sure Mr. Fogg would have a date that works equally for him. Yeah, well, the now, all, the all the interested parties will know well in advance, and we'd probably post the date of the open meeting, um, the information meeting, at the same time we put the warning up for the special time. Right. And we'd like to have SAPA, and we'd like to have the media there as well to get that information out. That would be a good one. I'm sure. I'm sure it'd be a very we fun meeting. Typically, have a Sabbath year. Yeah. Yeah. Sabbath yeah. is the court's all over me. But they're, they're, uh, are they on? Yeah, they're, they're, not, they're not active. Okay. Uh, Neil, uh, Neil Chadbourne. Yeah, Neil Chadbourne. Why, in the first place, to get into it, why did it come up for a vote to put that ordinance on us? Like oh, that? I'm sorry. Been that many years, was there an incident that happened? To create this after all these years, I haven't heard anybody ever complain about this. So, this initiated out of the Trails and Rural Economy Com Committee. Uh, we are we've taken an active interest in Harkness Park as far as maintaining it, putting up uh, new gates, uh, new kiosks uh, to advertise it for uh, for trails, uh, for recreational walking or running or biking. Um, we have Mutt Cross Park now, which uh, there's a connector to the Hartness Park from the Mutt Cross Park. Um, we're working on some additional signage, uh, but there's there's been more interest in uh, in upgrading or enhancing the trail for walkability 
Um, there's, but they're going to be discussing uh, at their next meeting the um, uh, the old ski jump hut, uh, which is deteriorating, and um, and and then they've had uh, a work they're having work crews come in to work on uh, Delro end of it, where there's some uh, water or, or wetland area, uh, so they're going to make that easier access to traverse and, and to hike up. So they're promoting. Hiking and walking and whatever whatever other activities uh, are accessible to the park. So that, you that's, did that at the other end of uh, Edgar Mays down there, coming in that way. You get that is they're coming in on that park right down through there where they're they're walking. There's actually when I've been hunting in there in October in a tree stand, I've seen guys go right by on a bicycle. Yeah. All the way down, and yeah. you're gonna have a hard time getting that because I know John over there, the campground owner. You don't want anybody to go down through there. But we already have a trail there. It's parallel to the. It's up on through Cutler Drive. Uh, Is that up on Cutler Drive? Jim or Bettina? Uh, yeah. you make, there's an easement that goes that the streeters have uh, set a memorandum of understanding with the state officials who run Mont Ross Park that gives users a right of way between Macross Park and Skitchewog Trail, where right by the water tower entrance to Harvest. So you access that by going down through that chain. I know what it is, I have a key to that chain. Well, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, people can go from Harvest through the log roads back there. There are signs marking the through trail and then access Muckross from that direction, or vice versa, coming from Muckross, follow the through trail on to uh, the log roads and thence to Skitchewag or Muckross. Which I'm surprised the street gave me the permission to do that, because I know he kept a guy from New York on the other side and came down there and with the four-wheeler, and he's been keeping the four-wheelers out there. He told me. The four-wheelers are a part of it. Well, this is Muckross. Again, I, I don't want to get into a debate here between two people. I apologize for shutting it off. But I'm trying to explain what's yeah, been yeah. told to me by the state. Well, I can tell you they're going through Covered Drive and going down that way. I know that. They're even camping down there. Right, but back to your question. The increase or enhancement of the trails in the Hartness Park area for accessibility to walkers, bikers, Joggers. Uh, the short answer to your question is yeah. uh, how did this happen? Yeah. We have we as a town have selected a group of individuals to serve as an advisory capacity to the town to advise us on trails and developing our rural economy. That committee met and made the recommendation. They brought it to the select board. The select board voted affirmatively to pursue it. And they gave it to the ordinance committee, which wrote the actual ordinance and brought back. So that's how it got started, and that's where it came from. So now you know where it started. Now you have the opportunity I know, I think it to, to, fast. to see to see how it can. Where are you? I guess I didn't think about it. Well, that's water over the dam. Yeah. Say. Yeah. So we'll put it on Facebook, and someone will have to follow us. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, I'm really looking to wrap this up. Just a point of clarification. So no one can I get you to identify yourself. Walter Martone, <laughs> Springfield. Um, just so no one is surprised when we say the number, the required number of signatures, it's the required number of verified signatures. So if you submit a petition with 300 signatures on it, Barbara is and her staff will go through it to make sure that every single person there is a Springfield resident and is properly registered. So it's dangerous for you to just submit the exact number because once that happens, I think you then have five days to make it whole. Anyway, no, it's you, always better to have more. No, you have um, the, the town has 24 hours to verify signatures and then, um, then the petitioners have 48 hours 48 working hours, so weekends wouldn't count um, to uh, to remedy um, any issues with the petition. Yeah. Yeah. So she will look for duplicates 
She will look for incorrect addresses, all those types of things. So just so you- It, it gets matched against the checklist. It does. To verify does. the voter. Because I know a lot of times petition gets submitted, number of signatures, and then it's disqualified because they don't have enough verified. Yeah, uh, Kurt, I'm, I'm looking to wrap it up, but you have something to add or- Just a clarification. I appreciate your input. Okay. Uh, we as a committee have the checklist and we are going through those names to make sure that they are legit, they're registered voters. Um, we, we are doing that. And we also uh, are cognizant that if we miss a lot, that's extra work for Barbara. So we're, we're encouraging her. No, thank you. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. it. Yeah, that, that's going to help her out. All right. Okay. Thank everyone for coming in uh, regarding this issue. And I think we've tried to explain how we got here, where we are, and the process for going forward. And again, I uh, appreciate the interest and pay attention to the town website and other notification methods for uh, information in the future. Yeah. Yeah, Jeff, my usual know. announcement, you, you all are welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting. Oh. You're not required. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. yeah. Well, that's all right. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, what are you doing? Sure. I want to know. So, what is it? What we did out here, guys. He did. That's why I said. Yes, it's a big Walter, John, are you going to do a show? I just have to notice. No, okay. We got a slideshow. This is the most recent report? Yeah. So it's like it's the most recent. My God, you lost your audience. Your entire audience. It's on the web. Sorry, it goes forever. I said, I gotta get voted. I said, we're all automatic. Where did Jeff go? He went that way. That way. Okay. Uh, we can move on to uh, item number three. Uh, which is housing presentation, uh, Frank Knack, and if I have that, Knack, Knack, thank you. That, what it says, yeah, Mike, Mike Paul, otherwise. And um, Jeff's uh, memo to this was at the last board meeting, Tara Chase suggested having a representative of the Housing and Homelessness Alliance of Vermont (HHAV) do an overarching presentation around housing from the federal down to the local level, and we have Frank Knack. Uh, with us this evening to do a presentation. Well, thank you all for inviting me. Yeah, we do have your literature and it's available on the website. <laughs> um, and how much time? No. Three minutes. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's better than what I call Tara. So. <laughs> like 30 seconds. Like I'm part of the Duke Travel. I live in uh, Land Grove, right next to one there. Okay, so, wow. So not too far. 40 minutes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Come on, there are lots of questions. Yeah. It's shorter, right? Yeah. Uh, well, thank you all for the opportunity to uh, speak with you all tonight. Um, just a little background about HHAB. So, HHAB came together last summer with the result of a merger between two long standing Vermont organizations, the Vermont Coalition for Homelessness and the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition. Both of those organizations have been working in Vermont statewide for many years. One focused, obviously, on homelessness policy, the other focused on building more affordable housing. Uh, they have long worked together, recognizing that the solution to homelessness is more housing and more affordable housing. And last summer, after many years of merger talks, agreed to come together and merge to form HHAB. And so I joined HHAB back in uh, December, so I'm about eight months into HHAB. Um, we work in a number of ways. We work on basic education, legislative advocacy. So we work at the state level, at the local level, we coordinate with federal partners on federal legislation. Um, around anything that has to do with housing supports and services for housing and then homelessness policy. Um, we also serve as the collaborative applicant for the balance of state continuum of care. And so if you're not familiar with COCs, each state has one or more COCs that really serve as the foundation for homelessness response in a geographic region. 
So in Vermont, we have two. We have Chittenden County Homeless Alliance, which serves as the COC for Chittenden County, and then the Battles State, which is the COC for the rest of Vermont. And so we're the collaborative advocate for that, which means we functionally staff it and provide support. Um, that's a federal. It's a federal, yeah, so HUD-funded yeah. uh, engagement. Which agency do you work for? Uh, so I work for the Housing and Homelessness Alliance of Vermont. So we're contracted with... So you're an NGO. We're an, yeah, we're a 501c3 organization. Okay. Um, Which which agency do you get most of your direction from or your funding from? So the majority of our funding comes from HUD from to support the balance of state to care. care. Um, and that comes directly from HUD to okay. us. And then we get funding from the state and we also rely on membership dollars. So we uh, have over 50 member organizations that grow, you know, range from housing trusts like Chin County Home, uh, Chitin, um, uh, Champlain Housing Trust and local housing trusts. Uh, to like statewide entities like Vermont Housing Conservation Board, from Housing Finance Agency, and then also local housers and shelter providers. Um, and so that provides the majority of our advocacy funds because obviously our federal funds are restricted in terms of what we can do with that. So we don't lobby at those funds, for example. Um, and so to give you a sense of where we're at in Vermont right now, um, luckily the Vermont Housing Finance Agency's um, statewide housing needs assessment, the new version which runs 2025 to 2029, just came out. Um, and no surprise to y'all, but Vermont has huge housing shortages, um, particularly in light of COVID. Um, so according to VHCB, I mean VHFA, Vermont is in need, to, in need of approximately 36,000 more housing units by 2029. So a massive undertaking um, in front of us. At the same time, we also continue to have a serious homelessness crisis in Vermont. Um, so as the collaborative advocate for the COC, we oversee the coordinate point in time count, which is the kind of major resource nationally for understanding homelessness in each state. So the way that works is in every state on the same night each year, in January, uh, there is a statewide homelessness count. And so advocates from around the state and in each state go out and they count the number of people who are unsheltered um, on any given night, on that given night. And so in Vermont, uh, according to the most recent count, was around 3,500 people in one night. And to make matters worse, we know that that is an undercount because it only counts the people who engage with our professionally under-resourced service providers and shelter providers across the state. Um, Vermont, that number represents the second highest per capita number in the country. And so Vermont has a serious crisis on its hands around homelessness um, response. Um, and um, to make matters worse, this last legislative session, the general, uh, the, the Vermont legislature Past legislation uh, restricting for the restricting the general assistance emergency housing program. And so for those who aren't familiar with that program, uh, we basically have two kind of globally homelessness response systems in Vermont. We have the shelters, uh, which are both kind of private nonprofit funded by the state uh, around the around the state that provide about 531 shelter beds on any given night, uh, household capacity on any given night. And when you have those maxed out, we have what's called the General Assistance Emergency Housing Program, which is a state-funded program, commonly known as the Hotel Motel Program, the last couple of years during COVID. Um, and so that was really the backup program. And so we have 541 household capacity with shelters. We have you know 3,500 plus unhoused people in Vermont. And so obviously with the math, there's a massive need for additional capacity. And so the GA program was set up to really try and deal with some of that, that uh, gap. Um, and so um, a couple of years ago, they restricted the GA program to certain eligibility criteria. And so under the new criteria, which has been in, in place for a little while, it's really to deal with the most vulnerable Vermonters. So uh, people over 65, uh, families with children, people who are pregnant, um, people with disabilities, documented disabilities, um, uh, people um, uh, experiencing fleeing domestic violence, and then kind of another core piece is people in you know who uh, lost their housing because of something like a natural disaster, like the flood two summers ago here. Um, and so that program, I'm sorry, it's an or catastrophic. Or so catastrophic. if a, yeah. a, a homeowner sold the building that they had a renting had been renting, yeah. And so when we're talking about the GA program, I think one thing that gets lost these days when we're debating a hotel motel program is it's, it's only 
providing shelter to those who meet these very narrow criteria of people, so the most vulnerable people in our state. And so last legislative session, um, they created additional caps and restrictions on that program, which went into effect about a week ago in Vermont. And so under those new restrictions, um, on September 15th, they capped the number of uh, hotel units available across Vermont um, per night at 1,100. So prior to that, we were at over 1,400 people in the shelters. And so right off the bat, we lost 300 households. And is that Act 113? Act 113, correct. Um, and then on September 19th, the second kind of cap restriction related to that program hit, which was 80 nights. And so under the legislation, what was what? 80 nights eligibility. Yep. And so under that legislation, Act 113, starting July 1 of this year, individuals, the kind of vulnerable individuals who qualified were only eligible for 80 nights of stay under the program. And so September 5th, 19th is when that, that hit. And so if you actually look at it, even in that report from, from the state, their projections, they're projecting that by October 8th, 75% or over 75% of the, you know, 1,400-ish people who are uh, sheltered, uh, households sheltered on July 1 are going to be at their 80-day mark and are going to be unsheltered into a system where we have no more shelter beds. Our service providers are completely maxed out. You know, I was on the phone with our service providers this morning, and they're talking like, we're trying to find, we're giving tents to families with small children and toddlers. We're trying to find in public parks places to plug oxygen tanks in because there's nowhere for people to go and plugging an oxygen tank. Um, it's just kind of triage at this point. They're literally, you know, trying to keep people alive and not able to kind of do the myriad of other things that they're supposed to be doing as shelter providers and first responders in our state. And so there is a huge crisis. And so um, unfortunately, kind of at the municipal level, there's not a whole lot to do, I mean, there's lots of things that can be done, but to truly solve this crisis, we need massive infusion of revenue from the state to provide shelter for these folks. Um, and so there'll be a number of opportunities this upcoming session um, to, to address that situation. Um, and unfortunately, in the interim, what the state has done is left municipalities in a horrible position of having to deal with this crisis firsthand without having any of the resources they need to actually deal with it. Um, and so some of the concerns I guess I would want to lift up is, you know, we've heard in some jurisdictions uh, attempts to, you know, criminalize um, unsheltered homelessness in Vermont, um, particularly in light of a Supreme Court case that came down last uh, June in Grants Pass was the name of the case. Um, uh, there's some talk that Grants Pass opens up the opportunity for municipalities to criminalize people living in public spaces when there's no shelter available. That's not what that decision said. That decision was very narrow. The question was whether the Eighth Amendment's Cruel and Unusual, unusual Punishment Clause uh, uh, prohibits municipalities from passing anti-camping ordinances when no other shelter is available. It had nothing to do with the myriad other ways that those challenges could be forth, like due process challenges, excessive fine challenges, et cetera. Um, and so from a kind of a legal perspective, I think there are some concerns, but from a basic public policy and research-based perspective, that is like the absolute worst thing that we could be doing in, in Vermont right now. Because um, when you think about it, the solution to getting people out of being unsheltered and homeless is to provide them with stable, secure housing. And to get there often, you know, to get a house, as you all know, there are background checks. If you have a criminal record, that flags on your background check. One of the things that we know that creates stability is employment. When you're trying to get employment and you have a criminal record, that makes it more difficult to get employment. And so instead of putting hurdles in front of people, what we're really advocating are the data-driven responses that are based on decades in emergency shelter and getting people the stability they need to kind of build that, that stability so that they can move up to permanent housing their employment, kind of keep their kids in school, all the things that we know make our, our community safer uh, all around. Um, so that's kind of a global overview. I know that was really kind of dark because we're not in a good place right now, but also want to note that we are seeing major progress in our state. You know, the state did make ma major investments over the last couple of years in uh, permanent um, um, uh, housing 
for, for uh, affordable housing uh, for folks in need. We're seeing ground breakings happening across the state right now. I think we've had over 2,000 units come online in just the last couple of years with state investments for uh, especially affordable housing, which are units that you know ensure that people forever have a place to stay that they can afford. <laughs> Um, and so we're seeing progress. It's taking time, um, but that's kind of the state of affairs right now. I didn't know if there was anything else you wanted me to highlight at this point. No, I think that was good. No. Um, I did want to just ask one question on because I can't remember the point of time for this year when you said 3,500 people in that one night, just highlighting it's the last week of January. It's also really, really cold. Um, were we counting those that were couch surfing? So they count under HUD. So if folks were caught, then they were, but okay. yeah. And I think that's another thing that we're really concerned about are some of the solutions that have been pushed by the legislature in terms of like, well, why can't these people just couch surf? And so I think that makes sense in theory, but when you actually look at the facts on that, it's, cre it's really destructive. And so a lot of people, their leases specify this person lives in this house. This, this, these are the number of people who live in this house. The lease specifies that. And when you have other people coming in there, that puts not only that person at risk, but the people who live in that house are being evicted for breaking their lease agreement. And did you say earlier that the 3,500 count was from homeless shelter managers and clients who agreed to be counted as See, such? It's for not necessarily agreed, but. <clears throat> You, I mean, you can yeah. see where it means you actually do So it's um so if somebody's living in their car, they're not counted. They are if they came into my office that day or they come in the next yeah, day. But, or if one of my case managers saw them, or if Chief Burnham saw them out in their car and checks in and he can let us know. Yeah. Um so any person yeah. can let us know. We don't have to get all the information, it's just a quick count. Yeah. But also we do reach out to the school to make sure that the um, homeless liaison, McKenny Vento, people who are supporting families that are literally homeless, they're making sure that they're reporting to us. We are going to the health centers to make sure that we're checking in there. Um years past we actually had somebody who did the outreach and walked around at nighttime to count and go to different areas where we know that people were camping um, we did not do that this year and that count was when uh it's december 24th i mean it's uh, a, january 24th yeah it's the third yeah. wednesday of january third wednesday of january. yeah we can count the day of and the day after those are the two days that we're able to count so every person that's in the motel gets counted. Every person that's in our shelter units also gets counted. So statistically, anybody estimate what how far off your count is? is what's, the, exactly what, what's, what's the margin of error on that? Like plus or minus five percent. Yeah, oh, yeah we'll go there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Plus or minus. Uh, um, plus minus. We know from like the coordinated entry <laughs> list and some others, it's an undercount by how much. It's really hard I, to tell. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go on a limb here and say if it's 3,500 or if it's 5,000, mm -hmm. the same problem exists. Yes. So the number, I don't mm -hmm. think we should get hung up on the number. Mm -hmm. Just my opinion. I, 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 I do realize this is part of this is about homeless, but I think one of your opening statements is that we need 36,000 new dwellings by 2029. Mm -hmm. Okay. So with Act 250, where we're limited to 75 builds per town city, that's 480 build sites. We don't have that many towns to allow us to get 75 units. Also, that total 36,000 is $1.2 billion in construction costs. What, what, uh, how is this going to come to some kind of resolution? I mean, we're, I mean, we're, we're already telling a story that it can't be solved. Mm -hmm. I mean, so there's there were a couple of solutions put forward the legislature next last year, and I know there's still discussion around uh, like regulatory reforms to try and make it easier, particularly right. in kind of town centers to build. Um, and provide resources that they need, like waste, like whatever infrastructure they may need. So I think that's definitely on the table. There's conversations around, um, and I know that's less of an issue in Springfield than it is in like Ludlow, for example, but on, you know, Airbnbs and trying to free up more units that way. 
Um, but there is serious conversation around revenue raising and the recognition that solve this crisis, we need to raise new revenue. And so there was a legislation last year that passed through the House with almost veto proof numbers that would have created a new tax bracket for people with taxable wealth over $500,000. And so that legislation, I think, would have raised approximately, I think it was like 60 or $70 million annually um, that would have been put into right. housing. And so recognizing that, like, you know, to build 36,000, you can't do that overnight. It's going right. to take years and years. And so providing these new revenue streams and year-over-year builds. So we have legislation last year that would have basically mapped out the capacity. And that 36,000 is all units. That's not just probably that affordable. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah, we had legislation that mapped out, like in terms of building affordable housing units, what can the current developers, nonprofit developers, right. housing trusts, et cetera, kind of reasonably build with their capacity to build. Yeah, so that drops us down to a billion. <laughs> yeah, so that, that is exactly what that legislation was. It was a 10 year, $1 billion plan. Yeah. Um, okay. But then that also creates new property tax, you know, yeah. property tax going forward. Yeah, yeah um, absolutely. It ensures that, you know, employers who are trying to hire right now and can't hire because there's no living. Again, like, I don't I don't know Springfield, but I work, I work in Bumbo at Okimo in the winters at, at the resort, and I know on weekends, like, there's huge need in Bumbo. They can't, you right. know, they can't hire people because, um, and so I looked up the, the report in the Hackney right. Needs Assessment Report, and so they didn't break it down by Springfield, but in Windsor County, for example, they're looking at between 2,000 and 3,100 3, units in that time frame of need. Um, I think that's low, but yeah, yeah. okay. Thank you. I just, yeah. I, and I know we definitely want to focus on on, on, on the, the, the more desperate problem, but if but it's all connected. Yeah, nobody's having any taxes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we can't have that problem. I think I think it's good that the board is aware of the issue. Uh, we're facing that. Uh, um, we're facing that daily, and I know this winter we don't have. Right now, we don't have emergency shelter mm -hmm. available for those cold temperatures either. Uh, a couple of things you mentioned, the, the, the legislature. Mm -hmm. uh, I would just like to say the governor's budget uh, that and expired in July, the end of July 31st, did not have any money in there for the GA assistance. And it was your legislature that put up the additional yeah. money to carry that through yes. to uh, this fall, Yes, uh, last week. Yeah. And we also uh, put in there that we negotiated an $80 per unit for the motels, yeah. an $80 the cap. Um, cap. Yeah. Um, so we did try to take some initiatives to put some put some money up um, and uh, and get the best benefit for that dollar amount. Definitely, uh, it's not the answer. Uh, the one point two billion is the answer, and and, uh, and unfortunately, that's where we're at. Those are the yeah. questions that we're facing. So. Yeah, but I think we have a much different percentage. You know, this the session that we did last, and so I think some of those revenue opportunities may be more realistic. We're hoping keep our fingers crossed. And DHCD, I know, is is building a large number of homes. I think you mentioned 2,000. Yeah, uh, yeah they're, they're putting up a large number of homes. In certain areas of the state, uh, much needed, uh, but uh, right now there's not enough contractors to build 36,000 units and not enough money, 1.2 billion is what I'm hearing, uh, if, if that's the number. Uh, and I don't mean to make light of it. I'm not making light of it. It's oh, just it's an yeah. enormous problem. Yes. But I, I want to thank the uh, I want to thank you and your agency, HHAB, and um, other agencies that you like. Some of us are aware of the, of the problems, and uh, certainly appreciate the efforts that you're at. The keeping it, yeah. Keeping it, yeah. 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 And the other thing, the other thing is. Uh, and I brought this up before. There's, uh, there was in my neighborhood. I, I live in a neighborhood of three streets, forty houses, forty five maybe. Four of them were vacant, and that's you mentioned the Airbnbs and um, the VRBOs. I get that right. Um, the other second homes, up those types of things mm -hmm. that are interfering with uh, housing units in our communities. And if there's uh, there, there was four vacant units in my neighborhood. Uh, I think one of them is occupied now, so it's down to three, but they're vacant. Just yeah. And I don't know how, that's another issue that uh, whoever uh, master plan, a strategic plan that we're, that we're trying to look at is uh, how do we get people to move off in their vacant home? Yeah. And there's also, I mean, to the extent it would be of interest, there's also funding available. I think it's through BHFA, I could confirm, we can back you all. 
around kind of uh, redoing houses that are, you know, in need of additional funding to get online. And so there's um, very low interest that forgivable loans available. Right. Set for folks. 30,000 for single family residents and 50 for... That sounds about right. I don't want to double. I have to get a bit since I've looked into that, but after X number of years, it was forgiven. Unfortunately, but, that comes with some restrictions on this, yes. which I don't think was a legislative intent, but they're... Around the renting to... Around the grant money for... Uh, oh. The yeah. yeah. There were some tweaks last year made to that statute to make it out the door easier, but I don't, there wasn't an issue that we were pointing Right, that's the intent I think the legislature yeah. was trying to accomplish to get that money out the door. Yeah. And what we're hearing is some of the contractors <laughs> are walking away from that program because of restrictions. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Frank. We thank you all for your time. And if there's ever any info that we can get to you all, please let us know. <laughs> Where do you make your office? Uh, so I traveled to Montpelier about half the time, and I work out of my house the other half, which is nice. So, yeah. Good. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate all the time. Thanks so much, Frank. Thank you, Kevin. number four. We have a uh, safety update from Police Street, Jeff Burnham. Yeah, in your packet, there, um, there's an update from Jeff Burnham, and uh, Chief is here tonight to um, discuss any questions or concerns the board may have. And you had hoped to introduce a new recovery coach, Jen Pearson. I'd like to start with that because she's been waiting patiently. She's in the front row. Um, <laughs> this is Jen Pearson, a representative of Turning Points. Uh, in cooperation with uh, the CEO, Mike Johnston, uh, we have established a relationship where uh, people who may be in need and express an interest, we would communicate with turning points on an emergency call basis, and they would come in, and then they would be kind of left to their own devices so they could talk about their privileged information of however they wanted to do that. Um, we were having excellent numbers in terms of follow-up, People that started talking to a, a, a recovery coach wanted to follow up either with the recovery coach sign up process or some form of treatment to the tune of like 50%. So, now granted, these were not huge numbers because we're talking about a couple dozen maybe. Um, but what happened was it, it, it solidified a relationship that we're trying to uh, uh, agree that recovery is a strong proponent of, of addressing a lot of our needs of uh, people in crisis. That facilitated um, the offer from um, Mike Johnson that, hey, would you be interested in this in a full-time basis? And of course, I jumped up and down and said, of course. Um, and he says, I got just the person for you. He introduced me to Jen, uh, I want to say close to a little over a month ago. And um, we uh, spoke and kicked some ideas around. And it was really quick and easy to decide that she was the right person for it. Um, this is Jen. She comes to the office often. It, we, we call it 40 hours a week, but she also has turning point responsibilities. So it's when she's done with that, she comes over, she rides. Um, she's establishing relationships with the officers now. We've already called her some calls where people were struggling, and we introduced them to Jen, and Jen just took it and ran with it. So um, the beginning stages is going as good as I had hoped. This is Jen, and if <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I'm stealing all your thunder. Please, please comment on anything that I didn't. Um, hi, Jen Harrison, the record. Um, it, it definitely has been a pretty easy transition into this. It's something that I never thought, you know, as somebody who's dealt with um, police and has a record that I would be working with the police department and helping others um, go through, um, you know, their journey of recovery. Um, and there are things that I've ran into that, you know, kind of homelessness. That's my biggest thing right now. Um, we can give them all the tents we want, but to point them in the direction on where they can properly, properly set up their tent is my biggest issue. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up here, but I don't know this town. Um, so that's just something that I'm running into. But other than that, the police department have been great. The officers have been great. Um, and, and knowing when to call me and just like the soft handoff from officer to me with an individual is been great the, the few times that I've been called. 
on scene to an incident. Um, but yeah, other than that, what I got. Well, thank you for that effort, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. So when when the police take you on a ride along and and you have an incident where you have an intervention, what do they do? Just kick you out of the car and you stay with the with the client and, and they come back and get you later? How does that physically? So that hasn't actually happened. <laughs> I haven't been in the car when an incident happens yet. Um, I've gotten the call back to the police department saying, hey, you know, can you come down? Um, and then I get the rundown of what the call was about, the incident, who this person is. And, um, and you follow it, up I follow up with with the individual and ask if, you know, they would like to talk to me more um, right then. And if they do, um, I have an office at Turning Points. So it's more one comfortable, it's in a better setting than, you know, saying, hey, you want to go to my office at the police department? Um, and so it kind of just makes everything a little bit better. And then that way I can use and get a hold of all my resources. Um, you know, what I'm doing is just to get their basic need right then and there um, for somebody who had been up all night and then finally, you know, sat down, slumped over and fell asleep, um, dehydrated, they're hungry. Um, so I'm that first basic need is get them something to eat. Um, so I have that contact and that resource to do that. Um, and, you know, if they want treatment, I have that phone call and that resource to call that person and get, a, you know, the ball rolling on um, intake. Uh, so it's just kind of working with everybody, you know, supportive housing, um, economic services, family center, um, resources that individuals may not know about or they may know about already and have already used that services, but because of their mental health, it's something that they can't retain that information. Um, that's what I'm seeing a lot of is mental health related um, issues right now, um, especially with, you know, homelessness. Um, those two together, you know, you can give somebody a tent, but they decide that they don't want to go and put it up because they feel safe where they are right now. But yeah, they might boot me out of the car, you know, if an incident happened. Here you go. No. We won't do that. They won't do that. We're, we're there to help, not to yes. make problems worse. And it was it was my intention that uh, a bulk of our calls for service, either crime related or not crime related, have a mental health issue or a substance misuse issue. And with the HCRS representative um, Donna Burns and now Jen, we have two resources that will pack one or both, but ideally some sort of combination to better address the problem because we are a, a blunt instrument for a, 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 an immediate problem, but the follow through is where we would lack simply for resources. Now we're trying to gather the resources. Excellent. And, and uh, one thing I didn't mention is this is sponsored by Turning Point. It's not a budget budgeted position. This is from uh, uh, money's from Turning Point. But we're happy she's here. Thank you. Should I continue? Yes. Thanks, Jen. Um, I have a bit of bad news. Uh, we had uh, four recruits in the academy, and I only have one left. Um, it is a screening device, and it served a purpose to screen out candidates that may not succeed. Um, however, the reports I'm getting from the academy staff of the recruit that's left is doing very well. I, I, and they're in the neighborhood of halfway. They're pretty close to eight, week seven or eight right now. So that's about halfway. Um, and so that is good. I'll have more information. They're looking for volunteers and um, many uh, department members that can go up and do a role playing and scenario type stuff that uh, I'll get a little bit more insight on how things are going. But uh, initial reports are very good. Um, uh, I don't want to hold you up any longer, so I'm going to quickly go through this. Uh, Reaching Rural Grant, um, as part of Project Action, we are drilling down on uh, grant topics and uh, kind of formatting how we're going to shape our application. We were directed by the coaches to pick a topic on what you would like these grant funds to be used for. And after consulting with the Project Action Board, uh, we're going to work on a project coordinator or project director, and that would be the facilitator of notes and reporting and advertising and marketing and grant information and stat gathering and all the behind the scenes stuff that is really important 
But right now we have it doled out to everybody that's already doing way too many things. So we think this is the most valuable use, uh, but that's where we're headed with it. Um, uh, the next great thing that's gonna happen is next Thursday. Um, uh, we, are, we are attempting to launch our uh, outreach um, with North Star Health. It's going to be from nine to noon. And once we have the confirmation, I'll share the location. Uh, but I haven't got confirmed yet because we're we're talking with the person uh, in charge of the location, and the goal there is to get our faces out there, and hopefully that beacon that is the North Star RV that's white and pink should stand out and contrast many storefronts and or parking areas, and they should re hopefully readily identify what we're doing and hopefully start the conversation. And by giving out coffee and donuts, I hope that is a, a nice breaker. That's great. <laughs> Um, and finally, uh, we have our upgrades in uh, dispatch, the computer uh, with dispatch consoles and radios and all the attachments are in. They're functioning. They came for a couple days and then they stayed overnight just to make sure there's no glitches, of which I think there was like one. Um, but things are working great. The fidelity is better. The reliability is better. I. I I am cautiously optimistic, but our coverage is like a hair better. But again, absent dealing with our antenna yeah. system and and uh, capacity on wattage and location, that's going to be a tall order. Uh, I don't want to bore you with what's going on with the communication task force in the state of Vermont, but they're doing a big assessment uh, of which I am kind of attaching myself to so I can stay on top of it. Um, everyone is saying the same problems we have, uh, coverage, reliability, funding. Um, and, and governance, because they're talking about maybe they'll regionalize, maybe they won't. Mm -hmm. um, so we're we're expressing some of our thoughts and concerns, and they're saying you're not alone, and so we have to take it into effect. Um, so the state of Vermont is researching it, and hopefully we can tap into any type of upgrades that they decide are effective, because if anyone knows any portable radios in the neighborhood, outside of a main thoroughfare, you don't have any coverage. Uh, but our radios are very clear for what we have. So I'm happy, and they stopped glitching. We, they were glitching for like over a year. We have to reset them every day. That, that doesn't happen. But they're, they're much more reliable. So I appreciate all the support in that, because I know they'd redirect money for that, but it's done finally. Excellent. Questions, concerns, thoughts? Excellent. Oh, I do have a question. In the, in, in the in the letter, you said something about the screening process for applicants for the academy. Um, is there another step that we should be taking here before we hire somebody and send them up there? The answer is yes. Um, this the academy used to do this, and for whatever decision, I don't. I wasn't part of it because before I got here, they got rid of it. And um, that and adjusting their physical fitness assessments, um, they scaled it down. Um, that's through the state. Um, once we had an issue with um, some testing, we decided we need to do our own uh, assessment, and I, I tasked the lieutenant with researching this. He reached out to a couple neighboring towns and um, communities, and, and we located a, a, a private entity that does this, and the research background is it has been vetted through the ADA, and, and it's uh, accepted nationally as being objective and fair, because we don't want to um, start kind of pigeonholing people, and, and if there is a, uh, a a minority that this would kind of isolate, like some of the um, issues with night, nationwide testing, uh, we didn't want that. We had this um, uh, association with this company because it has some sort of screening that's objective, and that was our goal. Not that we don't, we want it for merit, not for any type of um, uh, disability or, or, or something uh, life gave you and it put you behind the eight ball. We just want general assessment. And um, reading comprehension math, uh, deductive reasoning, that basic stuff is what it is covers. And you're going to start to implement that in the next round of firing? Yes. When's the next uh, academy finals? February. February. I have people testing this week in the application process. Um, we'll see how many follow through because from the moment you start testing, we start losing people for various reasons. Mm -hmm. um, they understand the scope of the commitment, the, the academy, the, um, 
uh, in-person overnight academy for 17 weeks. Some people have never been away from the home for 17 weeks. So there's a lot of things that people start to understand. Oh, that's not what I want. So we try to be as transparent as we can, explain that this is the hurdle, but we're going to try and support you as best we can. Um, we want them to be aware, not have the rug pulled out from underneath them. So we try and be as clear as we can, understanding some of the challenges that are in front of us. The good news is you have people that are still applying. Yes. That is wonderful news. And I, it's all to the officers, just networking. Um, I've been to a couple uh, job fairs, and I've had zero responses. To them, three, and I've had zero responses. No emails, no contacts, no phone calls, nothing. So it, it's good for a show, but it, it didn't amount to much. Still working on it. Thanks, Pete. Uh, any possibility um, the candidates that left um, to recommit for a future class or to be determined to be at, this, at this point unknown um we don't know what the problem is we don't know what to fix so i don't know how to proceed without having some sort of plan of action and, and the reason i ask that is i know we ran into this problem one of the previous classes and the state police got involved with the test scores and you did mention that they kind of relaxed a little bit mm -hmm. on, on the physical side of it so um, because a, a couple of candidates were going to be uh, terminated from the from the training. Yes, but that was um, there were some adjustments made, and that was reversed. I think at that time. That I'm talking yes, about. I I don't know the inner workings of that, other than I knew the outcome, which really put me in an awkward position. Yeah. But we pushed through, and we spoke with the people involved, and we got them to the end of the line. And I'm um, happy with the result. Yeah. That, that's my point is going forward. What it the police academy has always been like a standalone, it's our own thing. And I and I respect that. It, it's trying to get uh, trying to get people through those spots. Uh, it is challenging without accepting just anybody. I, I mean I, I get the process. Well, thanks for that. Certainly welcome. I I have one question. Oh, and, and and I am putting you on the spot, and I apologize ahead of time. I think Carol left. Uh, feel free to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> we we in Project Action have a weekly meeting, and in the weekly meeting, they're talking about the topic that the previous presenter was talking about, and they're concerned. And I want to express my commitment to not creating or criminalizing homelessness, but I still need a resolution because at some point. There's going to be two sides of the coin. Both are correct. Mm -hmm. I don't want them there because they're technically trespassing. This person is here because they don't have any other place to go. That puts me in a very awkward position, but I still have to make a decision. I would love some options other than all or nothing. Mm -hmm. If you have any words of wisdom, strategies, thoughts, <laughs> clever ideas, aha moments, I would really appreciate it. Because this this won't happen Monday through Friday between 8 and 5. This will happen at 10 p.m. on Saturday on the 8th when there's about several hundred more people that park outside someplace that someone says, I don't want them there. And lawfully, they have the capacity to do that. This is all anecdotally. I do not know of anything right now. But I'm anticipating it. And rather than dealing with it at midnight on the weekend, I'd love to find some ideas, strategies, clever ideas. Uh, what are other people doing? That we can try and help. I am not. I am not interested in. I'm not looking forward to being the homeward homelessness police. I don't want that. I I want to help, but I have to help everybody, and I don't know how to do that if there's a law a line that's drawn in the sand. So I would love any input that you could provide. Sounds like an ordinance project to me. Um, possibly. Realizing I don't expect an answer now because I just dropped it on you, but I just want some sort of thought process that I, I would I'd be happy to come back or sit on an ordinance committee meeting and something like that just to come up with an idea because it's going to happen. Yeah, I think that's a good good point uh, through the project action group, which is meeting regularly right now with the various agencies and entities that that are, are trying to address this, and if we can come up with uh, some thoughts around that, uh, perhaps. 
an ordinance or a resolution. I'm not. I, I'm not aware that we are looking to restrict home, homelessness in, in Springfield to any certain ex or level. Or, or, or. I think everybody needs to be safe. And I think that that's the approach that we have to take. And I think that that, and I, I wasn't trying to be flipped, I, I think it's a project for the Ordinance Committee to review with the various partners in, in the area to come up with a solution to help achieve. October 1st, 2.30. There's a housing meeting and it's our big continuum of care COC meeting. I would love to invite you to come to that and the ordinance committee as that we are looking to try to address that. Um, you said the second? October 1st. First. It's the first Tuesday of the month at 2 30. It's via Zoom. Two thirty. The same time you go to the dentist. It is the two thirty time. Two thirty. And I can email those that are interested to the three. I put it in here so I'll be Thanks. available. But please, yes, email me. Perfect. We have to warn them. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's a public meeting. It is a public meeting. It's 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 a oh, okay. And not a mm -hmm. public or a select board. Well, I'll let the town manager mm -hmm. make it. We're just not able to uh, enact any of the yeah. town legislation. Thanks, Chief. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank it. You so um, Jen, thanks for coming in. Jen. Oh, appreciate it. Uh, yeah, at the, more to come, I'm sure. And, and right. my, my other concern, uh, and the same as I'm having in the room, is as we start approaching cold weather this winter, we brought up, uh, Frank Knack brought it up. We're going to start approaching cold weather, and, and what do we do for? I know there's going to be some emergency funding again to get people on those cold days or whatever. At least sheltered temporarily, but it's all only temporary. So and the motel cap does not get lifted until December first. Yeah. So also it's later than what it used to be, right? The adverse weather time used to be the beginning of November ish, fifteenth, um, and so that we have a little bit longer. We will see more households coming to town in the next two weeks. Good point. Fifteenth to be exact. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. Oh, I'm um, sorry. I, I checked just a second ago. I didn't see any hands up. Uh, That's okay. Uh, uh, I just, I also attended that project action meeting that the chief was referencing. And one of the interesting questions that I thought that came up, well, there were lots of interesting things, but one of the ones surrounding homelessness was that currently, um, <clears throat> One of the few things that service agencies that are helping the homeless can do currently is to provide them with a tent and camping gear. And the question at that meeting that was asked was, well, where can people legally camp? And one of the other participants at that meeting had said, well, that's something that towns should probably work on. So I think maybe coming at it from that angle of how can we make it legal to camp somewhere, you know, like, and another thing you have to consider when talking about homelessness is, is, is um, accessibility to services. Um, so, you know, like, can we allow camping as a town? I'm not speaking for the town, I'm just saying objectively. Um, as a town, if we were to allow camping in Springfield at, say, certain town parks, you know, are they on public transportation where people can get back to the services that they need? So, for example, the the town forest at the other end of town would be out of everyone's backyard, but also far away from services and not on a public transportation line. So those are questions that really are important to consider when considering how to help the people that are out there this winter. Thanks, Jules. Yep, thank you.
And sorry, I missed you. I, I like I say, I checked uh, just just before I shifted uh, my train of thought, and I didn't see any hands up. I apologize. Okay. It's okay. I didn't have to, anything to ask the chief anyway. So. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Uh, more to come on that subject for sure. Uh, item number five: River Street culvert proposal. Uh, yeah, there are four corrugated aluminum culverts underneath River Street um, that serve to move stormwater from the other side of River Street over to the river. Recently, a depression in River Street was noted. Upon inspection, it was found that the, the, those four culverts are failing. They're all put at the same time, so it's not a surprise. Um, previously, the town has had success with slip lining culverts. Most recently, the culvert under Park Street near the intersection of Clement Road. Um, Public Works is recommending the same solution for these four for these four culverts. Um, the cost of the materials to do the cul do one culvert is ninety five hundred dollars. The cost of the materials to do all four culverts is thirty two hundred dollars. Thirty two thousand. Thank you. Um, uh, due to the and I write it down. I think I can read. Um, due to the high volume of traffic on River Street, we recommend doing all four culverts. The town would perform all the actual labor. And the price is for materials only. I asked the board to approve the project at a cost of thirty two thousand dollars, with the funds coming from the bridge and culvert fund. Where where is the culvert that's starting to get a depression? It's um, just north of the pedestrian bridge. So this is water that comes from behind the bigger retaining wall and some along the road that picks up and goes yeah. across. And and so and since those are starting to start a slight depression there, um, they did they camered it to see and saw that it was failing. Is there access from both ends? We no, we'll we'll do it with our excavator from the riverside riverside and we'll but we'll add a slip liner right in with the with our excavator oh okay okay it's so, okay so we're not digging up the street we're just putting we're the, not digging up the street. We're, we're putting that to protect the street yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> where the depression is a uh, simple question uh, once we do the slip line if we vote to approve this uh, the depression is still going to be there Will we have to? Is it deep enough where it, it's, it's no, it's not deep enough where we have to do it. It's a dimple now, so it's not. Uh, I see a hand up. Yes, sir. Eric Perkin, how are you, sir? Um, you said that the town would do the work, is that correct? Yeah, okay. Um, for those of you that don't know, I used to work for the town. Yeah, my only concern to that would be. I was there when they did the Park Street slip culvert when we had that other company doing it, yeah. uh, EJP or whatever. And to my knowledge, nobody that works for Public Works is confined space trained. So how would they get into the culvert to seal it like those guys did? Um, this is these are much smaller culverts, but nobody's getting into the culvert. Oh, okay, so it's not like the one on Park. No, no, these are four smaller ones. Yeah, okay. these these would be ninety five hundred each. We do them. The one on Park Street, the materials alone was sixty two thousand. Yeah. So well, like that's just a whole, yeah, just a matter of scale. Oh, okay. A good point. Thank you. Well, anyway, yeah, I'll move. I'll move. I'll move. I'll move. Yeah, I'll move to uh, approve the expenditure of thirty thousand dollars for slip lining material for the. Uh, is there a second? I'll second. No, you don't want to second me. I won't say it. I'm dying. All right, so we do have a motion and seconded to approve the expenditure of $32,000 for the purpose of slip lining four culverts on River Street. And this is for materials only. The town is doing the labor. Um, just so we have. Is there any uh, discussion from board members? Dana, I do have one. Uh, sure. they, have they reviewed all four of these to know that they can do that easily? Or what? Uh, my point. My question is going to be: If we run into an issue, what, what do we have for backup? Or no, if we. No, they've already they've already checked that they can, they can do it. They're going to be able to do it. Yeah, the EJP actually came on site and looked to make sure that these slip liners, slip liners would work as they were done. Okay. Yeah, the EJP came and looked at it to make sure this this was the solution was workable. 
Very good. No, no further discussion from board members and comments from the audience. Or Zoom participants, confirm your speaking language. Barry? Thank you. So not seeing any hands up or attempts to speak from Zoom or those in, uh, in person, I'm going to call for the vote. Starting on my left with Mike Martin. Aye. Christine Moore says aye. Power Chase. Aye. And Mike Schmidt. Aye. <clears throat> that is four in the affirmative, recognizing the absence of so, other friend. Good luck. Uh, act on the Leland Avenue and Boynton Drive stormwater engineering contracts. Uh, yeah, last year the town um, was awarded a grant that will cover 80% of the expected $540,000 stormwater project. Um, the first step was to get an engineer approved by the state. The Frank Group was approved at the as the preliminary engineer with limited construction based engineering. The cost of these services is $56,500, with the town's portion being $11,300. The state requires that a different engineering firm provide the on-site, says on-site, on-site construction services. Um, this is a general requirement, not specific to the frame group. So they're not, they liked having multiple companies look at to make sure the solutions are, are going to work. Um, I recommend that the board accept the contract with the frame group to provide preliminary right-of-way and limited construction engineering services at a cost of 56,500 and authorize the manager to sign the contract. Our um, our MPM, our municipal project manager, is Mark and Logan, who we approved a few months ago as the MPM, uh, is here. And I don't know if you have any comments or you just. No, I just wanted to be here and get some right questions. But yeah, we've been working on this contract with uh, New Frame Group for a couple of weeks. And I, I had run by our project manager with DTrans as well. Um, and everybody else is. Looked at it and reviewed it and thinks that it's good to go. And so I think we're ready for, for Jeff to sign. Well, then I would move that we direct the town manager to sign the contract to do for any group for $56,500. I'll second that. Hey, we do have a motion and seconded to approve the award of $56,500 to the new train group for the preliminary engineering. Uh, Services uh, and authorize the town manager to sign the contract. Is there further discussion from a board member? Seeing any comments from the audience or a Zoom participant? Seeing any hands up for them to speak, call for the vote. Oh, and by the way, the town's portion of that is 11,300. Yeah. Yeah. Um, without further discussion or comments, I'll call for the vote starting on my left. Mike Martin. Aye. Christy Moore saying aye. Howard Chase. Aye. Mike Schmidt. Aye. That is four in the affirmative. Uh, and one absent uh, Heather Frank. Noting the absence of Heather Frank. Um, thank you, Logan, for coming in. Uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah. We'll have that done before snow flies. Yeah. 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 And <laughs> as I said earlier, you're welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting. I, this was enough. <laughs> <laughs> this was a good meeting. It was a lot of fun. That's a fair. That's a fair. Maybe we hope it is. Phil, you know, Thanks, Logan Lincoln. also is a representative for the state. This is this is a, this is your fun job, right? No, this is my other job. My day job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, Thanks, Logan. Have a good time. See you soon. Uh, item seven: Act on a thermal weed killer proposal. Uh, yes, the Public Works Department has been exploring possible op options to address the sidewalk weed situation for a couple of years. Um, one option was to pursue a permit with the state to use chemicals. However, that process hasn't yielded any results, and the use of chemicals in downtown could be real challenges. Recently, we learned a way, a new process to kill the weeds by shocking them thermally. Um, there was a demonstration last week, and the results were positive. In addition, the machine um, could, would have multiple uses including removing graffiti and street marking and stolen art. 
It says Dr. Um, um, Turner will be present. He's not. Um, I did talk to him today. He ended up at a conflict tonight. Um, he recommends that we, we purchase the 535 gallon um, aqua pro uh, the, with a total cost of 30542 That's the 29500 um, with options for the rotary nozzle for the pressure washer use and also the 12 inch linear um, weed killing tool with four nozzles. Uh, so the other uses this could be used for, as well as graffiti, is um, cleaning the salt off our, our trucks outside the garage. Um, and it also could um, be used in the winter where, when we have culverts that have, that have frozen items in them. Um, this, um, this machine could be used to heat up, heat up those ice blockages and clear the culverts. Um, this, so it's a tool that will be used all the time. It, it's, uh, I, I went to the demonstration and, and it was pretty impressive. What it does is it heats the water up to 230 degrees. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to accidentally get in front of it. Um, you, it heats up to 250 degrees and, and you drench the weeds. There's a, a nozzle for you. It actually turns water into steam and then back into water for drenching, drenching the, the weeds. Uh, we did a little a little section up on Summer Street. Went back a couple hours later and the weeds were all there. Um, the idea I did have to do it is it was uh, is in the spring. Obviously, it was great. We're so late this year that we didn't really do much because uh, we we need to start to die now anyway. Uh, we also took it down um, on River Street by the gas station where the lines were all crooked, and we had a couple of those um, stripes that were not in the right place. Turned it up to two hundred thirty degrees, and, and it, it pretty good power wash those pretty well. Um, so I, there, we see lots of uses for it. It'll help our our trucks. So it'll help us deal with that, with ice um, ice boxes and culverts. And we think this is very a very useful um, tool going forward that we use all the time. I will say also, Parks and Rec is pretty excited about it because they have people that um, are uh, artistically creative on some of their tables, like down at Riverside. Um, in ways that we probably they probably shouldn't be. So it, it would serve a lot of purpose. It could serve a lot of purposes throughout the town. Um, so I will try to answer any questions you may have. Do we know what's affecting us on not weed? No, this is for the weed along the mainstream stuff. It's not the big not weed stuff is okay. You have to dig that out and, and burn it. It's not this would address the not weed issue. But it would be, or even like the the bricks in front of the, the theater. You can do that all with this one. It, it's, it's almost like a a water gun. You can put a on it, so it's easy for one person to use, and, and it, um, so it wouldn't take up as many, as many staff members, and it's it's safer than you know, kicking rocks around or anything. Um, with the trip with the um, trimmers. Oh yes, oh these yeah. lacquers. Chairman. Mike Mark. So are we going to have a public works employee who's certified to run this and, 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 and do it every day of the week, uh, starting in whenever? It may not be every day of the week, but yeah, it um we the our guys try it right at the demonstration. Uh it's it's very easy. You, you have a, you put the knob, you push the you start the engine, you push the button to turn the if you want the heat on. Um, if you don't want the heat on, you can run it in a regular water up yeah, air temperature water also. It's not as effective. You can. Um, and it's just a spray gun. You, there's a nozzle, you pull a trigger. So we had we had a couple of our guys try it. And the demonstrator actually actually um, the demonstrator who came was a guy who uh, is a desk worker, he's a salesman. And does this include the trailer? Yes. I don't know. Hey, uh, I've, been, I've been looking for those three years, so thank you for your doors. We, we, yeah, we're going to get into conversations here, but we're going to have board discussion for uh, when yeah. we get a motion. Um, so I'm moving. You're moving it now? I am. I'm moving it now. The, the, the town by the uh, Aquapros 535 thermal weed killer with accessories for $30,542. Is that the right number? Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Where am I seeing that number? I see. I, I gave it. They, Donnie's was, was going to be here tonight. It's, you know, it's, it's the first there. two options. Yes, yeah, the first two options. He said we don't. The additional. He doesn't want the electric hose reel, and we don't need the 150 feet of hose. I mean, with the 100, simply because it's on wheels, we can move it. Yeah. And it's for streets. It's yeah, we use it for streets. We can use it for graffiti. We can use it to power wash the. So, so going to be eligible for the school to use it. Hmm? Would it be eligible for the school to use? When we're not using it, I would, I would expect. Uh, can we buy two? Uh, so no, but the school can buy one. I do have a motion. Is there a second? Yes, there's a second. Yes. There you go. I like that idea. Hey. Like that man's no. Further discussion from board members. I have one. Mm -hmm. Where's the money coming from? It's going to come from the equipment fund. From the equipment fund. And then we'll have to hold hold one with sharp purchases. Um, have we not taxed that already in previous? Right, but we're going to defer for the one we the one we held. We can cover the whole crop, and it's just the same thing with this. So that the what we're holding will cover that and this. But we are, I mean, we are actually by the way there are um, are all of our equipment funds because prices for equipment's gone down. Right, right. That, that's pieces. my concern is yeah. we're deferring a truck based off on the um, smaller equipment that we yeah. purchased, and then we get the um, information back from the uh, long term capital planning, and then yeah. the truck gets added back in. Uh, you know, I, I'm just I'm, yeah, this is just not, this is a piece of equipment that we've been looking looking to um, solve. Particularly the weed problem on Main Street uh, for many for, since I've been here for three years. So this is a solution. Since it's so simple, I know we get complaints every year, uh, and I know it's not our property, but uh, River Street going north by the plaza and up past McDonald's, that sidewalk area, the, the mm -hmm. weeds are always a, an issue. Yeah. And I know that, uh, the state doesn't get down here in a timely manner. When requested, they're off doing interviews. Yeah, they haven't done it at all. We sent our guys out there last year. Yeah, yeah, that's the point. There isn't any further discussion from board members. I'll open it up, and I saw a hand over here first. You want to go first? Or you go first. Oh, first. And so, my only question to that would be: I don't know the temperature on the hot seat. Maybe you do, since you're in Canada. But we already have a heated water uh, water pressure. Um, sorry, steam. steam, it does steam, it does, um, you know, the culvert simulator. We can't wash the trucks outside anyway, so I don't see how that's any benefit to us. We already have a machine that we own out right, right now in the shop that can, you know, heat up and do everything else that it would do. I mean, it takes two guys a couple days to do, you know, all the way from United all the way up through the plaza with a couple weed eaters. I mean, I don't really see the point of spending 30 grand on something that we already have. <laughs> It just seems like kind of is, is that one that you have now currently? Is that portable? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We used to load it in Bopperge, uh, you know, his one ton dump truck. They used to load that in there, and that's what Steve Knapp would do during the winter. He'd put it in the truck and he'd drive around and fix culverts that were, you know, frozen. He'd spend whatever time he needed to. And the other part of that would be the lost time. I mean, if you've got to fill up a water jug for it, I know, you know, just doing the sweeping with the, the big sweeper we have, you know, you're going to get water every every hour, every half hour. I can't imagine a little pressure wash like that. You're gonna have a big tank of water. So it's I would think take longer with that than it would with weed eaters. And with the three years I was with the town, I mean, I've never heard of any accidents with a weed eater kicking a rock up and breaking a window or causing damage. So well, I have. Yeah, they, they don't call you for close. You know what? I'm sure they don't call us, but yeah. I mean you would think that would trickle down, hey be careful or yeah. hey watch what you're doing or whatnot. But, mm -hmm. 30 grand for a pressure washer that we already have just seems like a waste of money. Oh. I have a question. Can I get you to identify yourself? Or... I'm Sean Delaney. I work for the I'm a mechanic at the highway department in town of Springfield. Mm -hmm. I had basically the same thing he was going to say. It's a pressure washer that uh, heats up its steam. It's on wheels. It's gas powered. I don't see the need for Thirty thousand dollars. The one we have now. Yes. Yeah. What's the tank capacity? So no, 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 water. What's the water capacity? You have to bring uh, water with you, which you'll have to do with this new unit also. Yeah. What's but, the capacity though? That was the question. What, what was the capacity of ours now? Would we? How many gallons? 
it's a separate tank that you, you, you hook a whole garden hose to it right now. Yeah. Okay. But if you you have to set up a gravity situation, the gravity feed it yeah. from a tank in a truck. And how do we use it right now? It barely gets used. The trucks don't get cleaned as they should. So it's a it's a power washer. It's a yes. heated power pressure washer. washer yeah. Pressure washer. The steam jenny, some people call them. Yeah. Um, and it's it's a fixed piece of equipment now in the garage. It's on wheels. It's you, you need it, you roll it out yeah. Um, yeah. to a better area because we, we can't pressure wash outside the building. But but you're saying you'd have to bring your own water supply with it. Yeah, which I think you you have to with this new unit also. Yeah. No, this water this comes from the attack of 535 gallons. No, measure. Well, you bring 275 totes with you. Yeah. Um, no, I, we, we can, I mean, these are these are our questions. We can bring them back. We can let it come back and bring it back to the next meeting. It's not something that is going to go away in in three weeks. Is there delivery issues with this piece of equipment? No. No. So we can wait three weeks and get. Yeah, these are in stock. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Eric. Yeah, I was just going to point out, kind of like Sean was saying, you know, if the new one has a 530 gallon tank, you could very easily put a tank like that in the back of S6, which is a truck that normally use mm -hmm. the, the pressure washer out of. And what would a tank like that cost? I mean, mm -hmm. probably a couple hundred bucks, I would assume, for a, I don't know. You're the thousand? Thing? Yeah, I mean, even a thousand bucks, you're saving 29 grand for something that the town already has. Mm -hmm. And then more importantly than that, if you're going to delay the purchase of a truck that I mean, Sean can attest that more than I can. I mean, these trucks are constantly breaking down because they're not getting maintained the way they should. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, delaying a truck purchase is kind of stupid to then buy something that the town already has that doesn't That's, get used. You just brought up something that uh, probably the select board, or at least me, I'll speak for myself, is not necessarily pleased with. We, we, we don't defer maintenance on trucks. We can buy a new one. Nope. Um, that gets concerning. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 I I can tell you firsthand, I drove S4. That truck, I'm, Sean can attest to it as well. There was stuff broken on that truck, and oh, it's getting it's getting treated in you know in six months. No, no, we're not doing that. We get back to the weed eater. Yep. We're back to the weed eater. You have a question, Sean? Yes, I do. I guess I, I guess I you know I'm I'm willing to entertain um, an analysis of the existing equipment versus proposed equipment, but we're not prepared to provide statistical or our specifications at this meeting right now. So I I, I agree with Mr. Melvis. If uh, if you'd like to postpone this discussion to the next meeting, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, but we would like to get some specifications on this existing piece of equipment, its portability potential for uh, capacity. This has got a 535 gallon tank. Then I'm also concerned about the duty cycle. You know, uh, mm -hmm. this this equipment appears to be designed for this specific purpose. So I would imagine that it has a continuous duty cycle, whereas I'm not so sure that something that's pressure washer for vehicles has the same duty cycle in terms of continuous mm -hmm. operation. Um, so, so I'd be concerned about that and then further uh, I, I'd like an analysis of the specifications in terms of the gallons per minute, mm -hmm. the PSI, and the temperature for the two pieces of equipment. Because I doubt very much that the portable pressure water marker that's in the garage right now is anywhere near the capacity of this piece of equipment that's being proposed. So I think we're comparing apples and oranges, but until we get yeah. the no, that's I, got, I got the apple in my hand. I'd like to know what the orange looks like. Yeah. So, yeah. Let's postpone it. And, and, and the effectiveness okay. against the graffiti and the other applications. Yeah, I think. yeah. yeah. sure. Yeah. Absolutely. So I'm I might, am I hearing it here, but drawing your second? And my I, yes, yes, yeah, I will withdraw I am. my second. I am. We'll take it up yeah. in the meeting. Okay. So without a motion for this piece of equipment. And with the recommendation that uh, it be brought back to us yep. another time, we'll consider this close for this evening and we'll move on. Thank you for coming in. Uh, oh, sorry. Doug. Just to add one thing in is if uh, you go with a new one, 
If they're not using or can't use the, the the existing one, is there a trade in value towards this new piece of equipment should be considered also? I think we'll get some information. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you everyone for coming in and speaking to that point. I'm going to move on to uh, item number eight, confirm a guardrail for this. Yeah, the town not much, has not done much guardrail work over the past few years, and there's now a lot of work to be done. This summer, the board approved an attachment that allows the town crew to do the work in-house. Uh, Johnny Turner was able to get two proposals for the guardrail materials. Highway safety, um, which was 38758 for a truckload, and Lafayette, which is 78458 for a truckload. As the budget includes $20,000 for guardrails, I asked Donnie to see how much material the town could get for $20,000. Unfortunately, ordering less than a full truckload means the town would have to pay for trucking, significantly reducing the, the amount of material received. As a result, I authorized the purchase of a full truckload in August so the guardrail work could commence this year. Um, over a two-year period, this will save the town several thousand dollars in trucking and purchase more guardrail material. I'm asking the board confirm this um, order for just a paragraph. The pleasure of court. Um, good question. So the $20,000 that's in the budget for guard risk, do we even know what that was going to purchase? In? No, it was so just, we just threw a number. It was, a, it was a number that, you know, when they asked for more, they wanted to get more guardrail. So, they asked for more and, and and then they're very much about the of yeah. So, so we really don't know how many linear feet we were budgeting. So no, was, we weren't budgeting linear feet. Yeah. So it sounds to me like we wouldn't have gotten very much for our money based on. We certainly have gotten less for. It. Yeah. Okay. So we don't really know how many years of guardrail we're purchasing. We don't because we haven't. Done the, theoretically, if we only bought twenty thousand dollars worth, it would get substantially yeah. less. Guardrail than we are going to get for thirty eight thousand. Yeah, so we're, now we this would um, this is uh, was forty three hundred seventy five feet of guardrail, so mm -hmm. eight tenths of a mile. So we might get over two years worth of. We, we probably get we'll probably get two years worth. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. And do you know where the immediate need is for guardrail placement? Uh, I know they're going to start on Valley Street. We're not. I, mean, I don't. I mean, it's. You drive around town, guardrail all the town is in bad shape. Yeah. A couple of questions I have before mm -hmm. we try to procure a motion here. Um, the town has not done much guardrail work over the past few years. How come? We don't have we didn't have the money for guardrail? We don't have the yeah. guardrail or we don't have the manpower or what? we um it, there was a manpower issue. Right now we're just down one one truck driver. Um so we, we have the capacity now. We're getting we're getting more done. I mean, this this um, I don't know if you if you've seen, but like on Middle Road, we did, we did that whole segment that was an erosion issue. Uh, we have two hundred and something um, segments that we have to deal with, um, and now we're able to do this in house because uh, we're, we're just getting we're getting more done. Uh, we did seven culverts on Brock and Mills Road you know, before paving. It's something we would have had to farm out in prior years. Um, we did a lot on the stormwater grant. We're just we're getting more done, and we could, we're just down one person right now. And, and the last couple of summers, we've down three, four, five people. So there's been fewer people, but also things seem to be getting done better this year. We have the post driver. Right? Yeah, we got that attachment. Right, so that's how we can do it in house. Yeah, before that, you could you would um, you could try to hammer it. Um, with a with a backhoe, we had somebody like, sort of holding it underneath. It was not OSHA an OSHA yeah, process. That is amazing. I would think that we go ahead and purchase a truckload. Gabriel, thirty-eight thousand seven fifty-eight seventy-five. Is that all in, Mister? Um. Yeah. Actually, I. I'm just asking you to confirm. I already authorized this. This happened in August. In order, in order to get the guardrail for, for this fall, I needed to order then. So I already authorized. I'm asking you. To, I'm asking people on the board to confirm the, the purchase. Absolutely. So moved. I'll second. 
So we do have a motion and seconded to confirm the purchase of the town manager's ordering of $38,758.75 truckload of Gabriel, of which 20,000 is in the current budget. And I'm assuming we would, yeah, we would have had 20,000 in the next budget unless we that's correct. BAC with the select board. I'm saying we just carry over from prior years, but we haven't done guardrails since I've been manager. So that was the final balance also yep. is carry over years. Yep. Um, discussion from board members. Any comments from the audience? Doug, you had your hand up. Yeah. Do we have a, uh, a program like the road maintenance program for scheduling and paving and stuff, or something like that for guardrails or, or, or retaining walls? That type of thing, so you can go at it, uh, uh, a plan, how much we're going to do and where we're going to do it uh, in the years to come. Um, for guardrails, we don't. It's, uh, it's something that's starting this year. We're going to have a plan once all the assets listed and, and schedule out the, the operating works that are in a way that hasn't been done. This yeah. is sort of starting that. Wasn't there a time period when the state replaced some of their guardrails? Were we getting some of their Use stuff, I guess we'd call it. Uh, no, we're not. We didn't. We didn't do that. Nope. At one point, we were look, We looked at some used oh. um, guardrail that there was rust issues, and you wouldn't. Yeah. It wouldn't be the same last of all. There's a reason why they're they're replacing it. Other comments, including Zoom participants. <laughs> Seeing any hands up or attempts to speak, come discussion here. So we'll follow up with a vote. Starting on my left with Mike Martin. All right. Christy Moore says aye. Tyra Chase. Aye. And Mike Schmidt. Aye. That is four in the affirmative, recognizing the absence of Heather Fram. <laughs> and so approved. Item number nine. Uh, yes, as we I just classify the highway superintendent. Yeah, uh, as I discussed uh, <clears> with <throat> the board, I'm requesting the board approve the position of highway superintendent. This position will be an exempt position at day grade 26. This change recognizes the increased responsibility of overseeing stormwater management, as well as the fact that the position oversees the largest number of employees in town. Um, the storm, stormwater is something in the strategic plan we've talked about. We have not had a stormwater division or budgeted for stormwater work. Uh, and more and more of this is coming up. Uh, this position, um, when we had the flooding and the, and the culvert washout on Slab City Road, uh, we also had a number of, and that was December of last year, we had a number of our dirt roads that also suffered a lot of erosion during that, that weird, freaky December rain. Um, so uh, this, uh, this position, the position was responsible for meeting with FEMA and, and working together uh, the FEMA reimbursement, which is something we haven't done that for um, the washouts before. And we'll recover about $150,000. Um, because we're dealing with stormwater now, we, this, we've also been approved for a culvert engineering grant on Grove Street. And the big, the one, the big one we talked about um, this uh, earlier was the, the $540,000 project over on Newland and Boynton. This is all coming under this under this position, um, so it, it, it's really um, important. The your net your net costs um, you're, you're going up, but then uh, this, you're going from a non-exempt to an exempt position. So you're going to save. Um, last year, this position had nearly ten thousand dollars in overtime. So your extra costs are, will, will be roughly in the ten thousand dollar range. So this position, I'll have some conversation. If nobody mm -hmm. else does any discussion more than before. Mm -hmm. um, so this position, it's a highway superintendent. We already have a water superintendent and a wastewater superintendent. Correct. So this elevates this position to a highway superintendent, which includes stormwater. I get that. Yeah. Um, the three positions will be equal. 
They already they already treated fairly equal uh, in the sense of hiring, um, disciplining employees, um, but this one had had been had been lower down, and I think the the addition of the stormwater and the the effective effectiveness we've been seeing this year. Um, that's wrong, and I discussed it and felt very strongly. That this is the right way to go. It allows us to have um, different flexibilities in the future. So, and we have a job description that the yeah, yeah, yeah it's in the packet. That's in the packet. And I'm just trying to understand the hierarchy. So, yeah. This position now, right now, the high we have a public works director, yeah, right, yeah, and all three positions work to work on the report back to, the public, to the public works, and that's still the same, that hasn't changed. Okay, uh, it's a pleasure, the board. I move that we, um, Oh, it the pay grade to 26. You reclassify the highway sewer. And add stormwater. And add stormwater management to that. Okay. Do we have any discussion from board members regarding the motion? My last thought is, um, since one, the three of them, I'm, I'm talking across the board yeah. now between the water, wastewater, and highway superintendents, that uh, there's certainly um, the expectation of cooperation. And mm -hmm. uh, so if, if we were to approve this, um, what what's going to be the communication out? I'm sure you'll have communication outward um, that we're able to get the, the work done and perform appropriately. Right. Um, in an emergency, of course, they, they all work together. Um, unfortunately, for decades, there's been sort of a, 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 ha a habit of the town when there's work to be done for water or wastewater. They steal highway guys, which prevent the highway workers from um, completing their tasks, which is another reason why we haven't um, than the, the guardrails or other things that are that our guys are capable of doing. Uh, so, but this, um, so that they said, when there's an emergency, obviously, like when the, the storm water, when the storm lines broke, they, everybody shows up. It's not that, but um, scheduled work, we got to make sure that all areas are getting their work done, not just treating, um, using one as, as a supply chain for other, other functions that I'm um, at the risk of them not getting their own works, but they won't work. We have, um, like I said, we have almost 200 segments of hydraulic, hydraulic connected um, uh, segments of road where the, where the, where the water runs on the side road down into a river or a larger stream. And that has to be done by 2027. And and we do, we do get some grants, like this year we've got, we got a number of grants um, for Mile Hill Road, uh, what was the other way just did? Oh, Randall Hill um, and Breezy Hill. But we can't do all 207 ourselves. And, and we didn't, like the Mill, Mile Hill Road is a, is a major project. And the state pays for 90% of that because they recognize that towns can't get this all done themselves. But we've shown this summer that we can do, we now have capacity and, and the ability to, um, to deal with these. If you haven't on, on if if you haven't been up on Middle Road, you see a good um, a good rock project there. Looks like just all the others, except we did it. We didn't have to to pay the thirty or fifty thousand. Um, this this week we're doing the um, this week we're doing the water a stormwater issue went on Broadway Mills Road and running the water out along Mays into the into the brook there. That stuff that is, that's something we're doing and not setting out anymore. But we're dealing with with what stormwater issues that we've never we haven't been dealing with. 
I, I appreciate that. It's good to hear. Mm -hmm. um, they should be proud of their efforts for sure. Mm -hmm. But if they weren't doing that in the past, uh, and is there between the water, wastewater, were, were, were there other efforts that have shifted from there, mm -hmm. those areas back to the highway? And does that leave us a gap or manpower shortage for or equipment shortage for the water or the wastewater? It could. Uh, I mean, water and wastewater are both, fully, are both fully staffed right now. And for a long time, water was not fully staffed. Um, so, but, so they have the, their operators that can that can do that work. Um, Jeremy can can run the, the backhoe for the water, for example. So there, there's still going to be times when we have to when we have to cooperate. But there could be times like when we got that call Gurney's in when the project was something beyond what we could do. I, I get those mm -hmm. concerns, but. Mm -hmm. Is there any other discussion from board members? Comments from the audience or um, Zoom participants? And Sean, I see your hand up. As you mentioned, um, borrowing help from, you know, wastewater or water department, borrowing help from the highway department. Yeah. Aren't they on the same team? They are, but if you're not, if you, when you have people in um, highway people doing working on the departments, they're not doing the guardrails, they're not doing the culverts, these things that um, they're not doing the grant aid work that, that needs to be done by state law. We, there's state road standards we have to adhere to. And we're not being able to keep up with that because we keep, you know, work, workers simply aren't um, available. Are a little different topic, but are we keeping up with that? We, uh, I'm not a fan of the excavator that was purchased, but it's way bigger than what a town would need. <laughs> I've done a lot of digging work in my life, mm -hmm. um, but it seems like that machine's way too big. And aren't we a maintenance facility, not a construction company? No, we're a town. We do. We maintain what we have, though, I mean, You can't just maintain what you have. Sometimes you have bigger projects. When we bought the excavator, uh, well, this was what's wrong with us. They bought the same excavator. That doesn't mean it's. Right side. No, but it doesn't mean that, that we're out of whack either. And I'm not, really not sure it's very appropriate for a town employee to speak to the board directly. Yeah, that, that decision has been made already. Uh, that's come and gone. So, I mean, that's not what's on the table tonight, is to. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so I, I appreciate that, but uh, owls barking at us. Yeah. yeah, somebody's up there. Nice. Oh, Rob. Somebody just got your hand up. Hi, Paul, I'm here. Oh, yeah. Hi. Um, so a couple things with that. Um, I mean, obviously, there's been stormwater issues since the dawn of time with roads around here. And then obviously, culverts washing out time to do things. Obviously, I have none of the training with the state, so I get they're doing a little bit more than that now, you know, in terms of self-reporting, you know, ditches and whatnot. Mm -hmm. The only problem I see, besides the fact that, like, it's not like the highway department is stealing or, you know, loaning out guys to water and wastewater all the time. Um, you know, there's a couple of things that, that kind of bugs me with this whole thing. The first is, I mean, obviously, me and Roy, the guy in charge of water and wastewater, they both had to go to schooling to get their licenses. And, you know, they had to work for those departments for a number of years. The guy that you guys are looking to promote didn't. But on top of that, he's already making a bunch more money than John Johnson was after, I think, 36 years that John worked here. So he's already getting paid more than the last guy with less experience to do this extra stuff. So, uh, again, I don't know yeah. if those conversations are necessarily relevant. Uh, we have had contracts that have come and gone and uh, pay increases have increased no. appropriately. And, um, but that's what I mean. Are you a Springfield resident? Uh, I pay taxes in the state, yeah. No, I'm a Springfield resident. Oh, no. Okay. No. Yeah. Robin. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know if I'm understanding this correctly. Is this a new position or just a pay raise for a current employee? Uh, neither. It, it's an enhanced um, responsibilities for an existing position. To include stormwater responsibilities. 
So it w- would be a pay raise for a current employee because they're taking on more responsibility. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Other comments? Hearing none, we'll uh, call for the vote. Standing on my left, Mike Martin. Aye. Christy Moore says aye. Tara Chase. Aye. And Mike Schmidt. Aye. That is for in the affirmative. And recognizing the absence of another friend. Thank you. Item 10, act on the budget calendar and call for the budget advisory committee members. Uh, yes, uh, I present the board with the proposed budget calendar for FY26 at the last meeting. I have not received any feedback or requested changes. I'm asking that the board approve the attack calendar. I will not want to hit it up. I had typos last time. It has the dates all right, but the, the, um, the, no, I think the October header said the wrong date. But everything is correct in this version. It agrees with my calendar. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a, I think the October meeting for over here goes back in that title for October. I think those dates didn't get changed. So we're being asked to approve this. They asked to, to set this as the as the budget calendar. We're required to do that by um, October first. I will move to approve the calendar. I'll second. We do have a motion and seconded to approve the budget calendar for fiscal year 2026, which we discussed a little bit last month, mm-hmm. and now it has been updated and has been presented. Further, or any discussion on the from board member comments from the audience. <laughs> Did you see the calendar? I looked at it briefly uh, this morning, actually. Not at the camp? Yeah, at the camp, yes. Because it affects you. <laughs> you don't really have anything to say. I don't have any say. He's done it for a few years, so he knows. <laughs> but, um, but to be fair, I mean, Doug had, I think I said last time, but Doug has had a really great idea that the, the budget advisory committee go and visit the sites yes. and, um, before the budgets are all handed out. Because do have and that's created a real time crunch for the BAC in the past. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, that's a great well idea, Doug. You guys doing this stuff? Yeah, no, I did, but I think. You know, we did it after yeah. or during the budget process versus before. And I think looking at the different wants or needs of the different departments ahead of time and the facilities that they have would be a better idea or a better mm-hmm. understanding of the budget of what they're requesting. You think you'll be uh, getting to them in time to uh, work on recommendations that we will see? Will you get Will you get to them? During the formulation process, is that your plan? No, to get to the department, or I, I, my recommendation would be uh, to the the BAC uh, once it's established to get them ahead of time before the budget process, before we even receive a budget, yeah. to have them take a look at the yeah. needs and wants of the during the formulation process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. good. But also, I mean, that, that prevents trying to see all the different sites in one week, which I think we tried to do last year or the year before. Yeah, it, yeah. And it's hard. for volunteers, it's just it's not realistic. Well, yeah, and you got to find out what times are available for everybody on the committee to, and the department heads to meet. Okay. Is there aren't any further comments or discussion. We'll call for the vote. Starting on my left, Mike Martin. All right. Christine Moore says aye. Tara Chase. Aye. Mike Schmidt. Aye. That's four in the affirmative, recognizing the absence of the Fram. And we have a budget calendar. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, we to the to the agenda, we added one additional item. We do have a, a DAC application uh, from John Bonds. He's been on the budget advisory committee, he says uh, three times previously. I that's it may have been four. But he said, he, he said three. Let's go with that. He's it's certainly not. I mean, and he, and he was the co-chair last year. 
So I think that uh, I, would, I would love to recommend John Bond be appointed again this year. So moved. Second. Second. Go ahead, Mike. I'll pick the second. <laughs> So we do have a motion and second to, to approve the appointment of John Bond to the Budget Advisory Committee. Is there any discussion from board members? Hearing none. Comments from the audience? Hearing seeing none, including Zoom participants, that is. John's not on, so he can't deny. Um, we'll call for the vote. Standing on my left, Mike Martin. Aye. Christy Moore says aye. Tara Chase. Aye. And Mike Schmidt. Aye. That is four in the affirmative, recognizing the absence of that. Thank you. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. Moving on to letter E, financial reports. Uh, yes, the, the warrants that the board has um, assigned tonight uh, it will be available on the website tomorrow. I, I saw that. I left for a meeting today, and when I got back, Brian was already gone, so we didn't get them posted today. But I'll make sure to post that on the website first thing tomorrow. And if anybody has any questions about any expenditures, please uh, call finance, and they can get all the information. I see one of the expenditures on here is for Basin Brothers for a large amount. Yeah, that's your, your that's your payment. I, I realize it's our paving. Yeah. I'm not that naive. I'm not understand what it is. It's, yeah. uh, where do we stand in the paving? Are we yeah, sure? Um, are we halfway, most of the way? Can I do it in my manager's report? Yep, I saw that. <laughs> Any day. No. <laughs> but you know, there's a certain amount of public that doesn't uh, read. No, I'm going to read it in just a few minutes. Pardon me? I'm just going to read it in a few minutes. So Got it. All right, I'll wait. I'll wait. Yeah. I, feel bad. Noted. I feel bad because the manager's report also includes a lot of homelessness stuff, too. It's, Almost heavy. There aren't any questions on the financials. Also, the, um, back in August, the board approved the uh, the purchasing authority for the manager and the uh, finance and the finance director to twenty thousand. So I made the changes to the three year policy that's out there. Right. It's been signed. Christy, you're on the first page, and I'm on the, um, on, on the second page. It was increasing from 2020. We've already moved it already. Man, we got a new truck, huh? Mm -hmm. From Benson, we got a new truck? Yeah. Yeah, we're available this time, you so. say. So we'll move on. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Um, manager's report. Manager's report. Yeah. yeah. So um, I've participated in a statewide initiative driven by town officials to discuss the homelessness and challenge that would grow with the recent changes to the Black Health Office. That's what we heard more about this evening. Uh, we understand, when I say we, uh, town managers, mayors, um, we understand that the state doesn't have funding to continue the program. However, simply releasing people into the communities isn't addressing the problem. It is forcing communities, especially those with more town services and social service providers, to do whatever we can to help the unhoused population. However, towns and other service providers don't have the or don't have resources, particularly shelter, to help these people. I believe that Springfield will begin seeing growth in the unhoused population and an increased demand on our services. There aren't any solutions, but this um, but this conversation needs to uh, continue. I. I don't know if any of you saw that there was a, a press conference last Wednesday and the town managers um, asked these questions. They said, you, you're, you're um, pushing the, the problem onto the towns. Uh, a simple example, like what the chief was talking about, is we've often had campers at Exit 7. Exit 7 is owned by the state, but they want the town to, to move, even though there's no place to move the people along. 
Uh, the Montpelier manager, Bill Frazier, I don't know, you probably have been there. Yeah, I know Bill. He's been there a while. Anyway, um, Bill, Bill said, look, we've got a number of empty state buildings in Montpelier, but we can't move them to, and we can't move them to state properties. Uh, so we have people that, are, that the state is, is releasing. And I understand there are financial restrictions, but there's no plan for these people. And it, it, it's put, it is increasing the cost in town, especially towns um, that have additional services, such as Brattleboro, Springfield, Broward, and particularly hard at this time. Um, Montpelier, Rockford, Burlington, they've all talked about the, how this is impacting their, their communities and their budgets. And we're going to see increased services that, um, that we have to provide as well. I, and I'm sure Tara will see that, that housing. But I, I'm sorry, I know you've already heard it a couple times tonight, but uh, that's something that's taken quite a bit of time the last couple of weeks in communicating um, with the other managers. I will say that Newsweek picked it up. I, 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 printed, a cop, I, I printed a link and sent it to Bill and actually quoted Bill. He, his, so he got his 15 minutes of fame in Newsweek. So. Um, also, the summer pavement project is moving along with the work on Eureka Road, Spencer Hollow Road, Hillside Road, Overlook Drive, Edgewood Road, and Russell Road complete. Um, Brockway Mills, we just paid, uh, we just received a bill for Brockway Mills Road. So, sorry, I missed that on the report. Um, the, the, the remaining big project is Pleasant Valley Road, which is 2.02 miles from uh, Chester Road over to the edge of pavement. And they're starting that any day now. We thought they were going to come last week, mm -hmm. um, but they're they're being pressured on time um, with all their projects also. It'll still get done this year. Um, and the, the last one is Highland Road. There's a the loop up of, of Cherry Hill up there um, that is on is on the plan. And they'll get to that after they after they do um, Pleasant Valley Road. I've also attended meetings on the Parks and Wilson and Trinity ex, um, Extension projects. At Parks and Wilson, we received the results. We received the results of the sampling done to date and the next steps. The next steps are minor sampling to fill a few data holes and to do a structural analysis and discuss the site with historic preservation. That all needs to be done before we can do the economic um, feasibility study. It's called the ECA. I don't know what the letters stand for. Actually, I know I've been told multiple times. I just don't remember. For the Tunerville Trail Extension, we received an updated plans and cost estimates. The next steps are to finish up some document work and proceed to Act 250. Um, for both projects, I expect to, I don't expect to really know more, but I'll have a timeline until next year, 2025. Um, on the plans, there's still some boundary work that's not accurate between the JNL site and the LBL site. Um, so that's the type of document stuff that needs to be cleaned up before we get to final get fi get to final easements and, and then go to 250. So those two things are also moving along. This morning, I received the last step, but I'm actually told by the state of Vermont Emergency Management, the last step um, for the Lincoln Street um, erosion slope remediation project. That's 90% um, funded by FEMA and also the Swedam project, which was also 90% funded by FEMA. So right now we're stuck in a, a little, the only thing holding things up now is the um, FEMA has run out of money, so they can't do anything. Um, they're expecting that sometime in the next three to four weeks that, that um, Congress will, will um, resolve that issue and then they'll start obligating funds again. So, but at this point, I've been told the town has done everything we could. We've jumped through all the hoops on those two projects, and I'm, I'm pretty excited um, that we're down, because I think the board, well, two two members on the board will remember this all started uh, over two years ago on these projects. Mm -hmm. Any questions on the manager's report? I have one. The Eureka Road. Yep. We, we've done call for work on the upper end. I think mm -hmm. you and I've had a conversation, so I had uh, I'm just I'm, I'm going with this. We we we've had the culvert work and the road rebuild on the upper end. We paved the lower end now. There's a piddle, uh, <laughs> a portion in the middle. I tried to short this up. Yeah. Uh, there's a section in the middle. I know we're doing a culvert um, 
or the culvert. Yeah. I think yeah, the culvert is finished today. Today, yeah. And they're paving um, it next week. So they're paving now that section. That, that the culvert over the culvert. Over the culvert. Uh, what are what are the plans for that middle section? Uh, we have not developed okay. plans. My hope is to do the middle, pave the whole middle section next year. But we have part to of our at, we, I have to get a better idea as we go through the budget, budget process yeah. how much money we're going to have. Okay. I think the budget's going to be awfully tight this year. Yeah, I, I haven't gotten questions from residents. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Where is the middle section from Woodbury Road to Barrow, Barrow Road? Is that a little beyond. Yeah, kind of. It's not quite to Woodbury. The first 4,000 feet stopped just below Woodbury Road. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what we did this year. And then the next not quite 4,000 feet would cover um, where the culvert we did this year and it would get not quite to borrow the road, I think. Well, that's in the depth there. That yeah, that's where the culvert is this year. So it go just from there to borrow the road? No, from um, before Woodbury to almost borrow the road. It'd be an extension of the existing. Yeah, so we won't have to break and take Correct. Okay. Then, um, as again, the, the two longer term members will know, uh, we we did um, take up the the pavement on the end of Eureka Road, and we did not repave it. Uh, the decision has not been made not to repave it. The the project was designed, and the and the grading and stuff. The, um, the engineering of that project was for that to be paved. You're talking about the upper end. The upper end, yeah. or the Wellens Field. And more than end. The, to the town line. Yeah, to the town line of Westfield. And did we think, extend that? I'm sorry? We did 1,200 feet one year. Did we, we extend it? I think we did 2,000 feet the first year, and then we did almost over 2,000 feet the next year. Okay. Because we had to stop before we got to the first big culprit, which we did last summer. Okay. So then the idea is to move out and, and finish paving the area. Other questions on town manager's report? Comment from the audience, Doug Johnson. Just a question uh, on the homeless part: Are we either statewide or seeing this because of uh, illegal aliens or migrants, whatever you want to call them, coming across the border, or is this something uh, another situation where uh, they're getting moved out of housing issues uh, or whatever? I, is there an increase in it, number one, over over the last years, and what is causing that increase? Part of it, and they mentioned, uh, Frank made mention of this, Knack, in his report, uh, and, and uh, Terry probably can speak to this. Um, when we came out of COVID, uh, we, during COVID, evictions were impossible. Uh, court wasn't picking them up. Court wasn't even in session during the COVID years. So now that COVID is over, the eviction process is picked back up. So there are that's contributing to some. The hotel, pro, motel, you can speak. Maybe you want to speak to this? You want to, you know. I'll fill in where you miss out if you want. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. And the motel program yeah. has come to an end. Uh, and and there are people that don't don't want housing assistance, if you will, but that's probably yeah. a smaller portion then. Um, uh, are we seeing an influx of illegal immigrants? I, I, I'm not hearing that. I'm, I'm not seeing where... Um, the the counts or no one's a head counts. The counts on the on the homeless do not appear to be fit that category. Yeah, it, it, based on the, the statistics that he provided in his report, I would say it's almost nil. Yeah. Okay, so that's, that's why I'm asking because I know I know now they're coming through the northern border just as much as they, well they had a big increase through the northern border versus uh um, of course the southern border obviously is getting a lot more than what the northern border is but uh i was concerned with that because you're seeing the influx of, of the people coming in and i was wondering a lot of that is being forced on the communities the federal government's not I, helping out at all i guess i'm going to i i I'd be careful. Uh, I'll say that a brave little state did an article on, and this wasn't speaking of people coming out of country, but just people coming from New Hampshire, Massachusetts, New York, so on and so forth. It's actually only roughly about 4% um, 
4% of the individuals that came and utilized the motel programs that were not from state, like from Vermont state. That was a small population that they studied, but I do remember that. Um, so that is definitely one piece that isn't, it's a big piece that people talk about all the time, but that's not an actual situation. A lot of people that were in the motels utilizing the motel program may have come from New Hampshire or Massachusetts, but they originally resided here or they had family and support net networks here. So they did come to this area. Um, the other part, a part of the eviction process really starting to stack everything up. Also, the cost of living, right? Everything has increased. If you look at the rents, um, to rent a, a, a one bedroom is very expensive right now. And then you look at the individuals who um, have physical disabilities or have developmental disabilities and they're living on Social Security, it's not enough to pay for an apartment. It's almost 100% of their income, which really should only be 30%. Yeah. So there's also a lack of income for those that are lived on fixed um, monies. One of the things that we talked about or the committee is involved in, obviously, is the housing is an issue, number one. But the thing is, is what I've written, I've written to Senator Welch on this about, you know, we have so many houses that are in, are, uh, are and uh, are in closure, foreclosure aspect of it, and they're not being kept up and stuff. And there's a number of them around town. There's there's one in my neighborhood. I can look at it across the street. The grass is four feet tall. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a shame. It's been like that. It'll be the fifth winter if we're coming through. It's a shame something can't be done about that in order to speed that process up uh, to make them available. I mean, it was good. It, Structurally, it's good, but there's a lot now because of the, the water during COVID. They left and froze, and you know, there's a lot of damage inside and stuff like that now. And I'm quite sure that's not the only house, but mm -hmm. there's a number of them around town that it's really a shame that they're vacant where they could be used to help there, supplement the, the housing right. shortages. There's been I'm going to say there's been an enormous effort from the legislature and, and the state government to fund housing. There's been a lot of units added on. 1.2 billion. We can't, that's that's an eighth of our state budget this past year. We there's just not enough money to fund all that. And even if you did fund the 1.2 billion, you're not going to find the contractors to do it. There are some restrictions on the housing. Uh, that some of the contractors are are, are now running into, and, and that is you got to have a, a low income or moderate income component. It's a limit, a restricted income component, and they're not wanting to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but they want to be able to build workforce housing. Uh, so there, there's there's some limitations on that, that. That this thing is an enormous problem, and it all boils back to money and capability and places to put the units. The legislature opened up Act 250 a little bit to have infill housing in our in our towns and, and communities that have um, water, wastewater, or wastewater infrastructure and zoning, and, and we're just not seeing the applications for housing. It's federal, it's state, and it unfortunately could be some local in there. Yeah, and, it, it's, um, and unfortunately, it's something that Springfield sort of started facing 40 yeah. years ago. Um, when, I, when I say that, I mean, Springfield used to have about its high po its population high, you know, about 20% more people. Our housing units are not down 20% since that time. Um, I think most of us, well, again, those, those long timers, uh, we remember when um, Park Street, Summer Street, Union Street were all single family homes. Mm -hmm. So we've already converted a number of those single family homes into multi family homes back when people did it without. They help, they help. And then, as we've seen, a lot of those have fallen into disrepair. Um, so it, it, it's a challenge, and it's been a challenge for Springfield for a long time. Um, and I don't, I wish I had an easy answer for it, but it, it seems like we just have fewer, pe fewer people in each housing unit than we used to have 40 years ago. And we're not going to solve this tonight. I'm sorry. No. Uh, yeah, thanks. I mean, come on, it would be really helpful for my job. Yeah, we have to solve it. <laughs> but I mean, Jeff's well, the right thing. I mean, we don't have any place to move people to. They, you have the to state. The state doesn't. The state won't let them go on the state. Um, and they expect the towns is to deal with these people. Okay.
I don't have any further questions on the manager's report. We'll move on to uh, future agenda items. Mike Martin. Nothing to report. We got budget coming up. Seems like I say that every period. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Derek. Um, just to follow up around the traffic light signals. I know we had act, talked about the blinking lights at Riverside because we don't have a crosswalk. We know that that's also on state property. So following up with where that is at okay. to help support the school board. It, that's, you're talking about the, the crosswalk by yes, the right. mm -hmm. yeah. Highway begins mm -hmm. after the Park Street. That's so the Park. That There's a little sign. Flashing light could go there. Could. Good. We'll have to deal with the state. Well, we do, but it's... I told you support found doing something there. Yeah, they, they, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that one, yeah, so the, the, anyway, they called me and they yeah. talked about putting up something like yeah. um, up at Unistry, which is $19,000. And I, I, I asked if they're, if they're planning on, on funding any of it. And I, I have not heard back. The, 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 town, the town has accepted donations from other private entities for the erection of traffic in this street. That's good. And we'd be happy to accept a donation from the school district. School's not a private entity, sorry. <laughs> Mike Schmidt. Uh, yes, I would like to have a discussion in the near future about what we're hearing on the decision for the hospital. Um, we got two meetings coming up this week. Mm -hmm. That's preliminary. I'm not sure everybody's up to speed on. Yeah, yeah. I sent the board an email today. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The board. This is a, the, the packet that we got from you. I sent yes. email to this but, morning. But it hasn't been, it is a final decision, right? No, it's a recommendation. It's a recommendation by uh, yeah, yeah. Been but, but, but yeah, making I believe that, and my concern is there's like three phases, there's like four phases. Um, two of them, the state has to ensure transportation um, and uh, reasonable coverage to a population area. And then they're supposed to rejigger the hospitals. But the states already come back and said, we can't do one and two. So they're just going to go ahead. The proposal is just to go ahead and in our case, basically close the hospital down and not provide for the transportation and the other care issues. Yeah, so like I said, there's two meetings uh, next week. Would you like for me to have, um, have Bob Adcock come? Uh, he could be a little busy on this. I'm trying to find out where right. Yeah, I, I, I mean, at some point, I would like. Is the fourteenth timely? I'm oh, sorry. The, our next meeting is the fourteenth. Correct. Right. So there's a meeting at North Star Health Clinic. Uh, there's a tour. Oh, the yeah. Legislators got an invitation on uh, Tuesday. Yeah, I think I the did, board did too. Yeah, the yeah, board board did well, too. but I didn't think that was what regarding that right? subject tomorrow. Who's that? No, Tuesday. Tuesday the eighth. Eighth October. Eight o'clock, eight a.m. Yeah, it's a tour. The consultant. It's just a tour, but they're going to be discussing. Will they? Okay. Uh, that's one of the Yeah. When was the? When's the hospital meeting? Oh, Springfield Hospital Legislators is this Wednesday, the twenty fifth. That's at five thirty. That's a legislative briefing on what they know so far. Over, we've already met with them once. They kind of rolled this the plan Zoom. out to us. As a murder, you mean the person? person. Are we invited? It's a legislative. You'll have to we'll have to reach out to Bob see if we can. I think the I think the select board should be involved. I, I would think he's not just a legislator. Yeah, this is going to impact Springfield pretty greatly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Our, we have citizens that have so, transportation you know, issues, but we have our, our ambulance service. Um, whatever they decide, if we don't, if they're not bringing people here, it's going to double yeah. their, their time awesome. out every time, which is going to mean that it's less time that we, that they're covering the rest of the people because it's just gone. Those are the critical calls. 
because they'll be doing transportation. Yeah, that came into the legislature to our legislative iPad, but we should reach out with Bob Adcock or Anna Smith and see if we can get select board invitations. Yeah, Bob's back in town. I got an email from him this morning unrelated to this. But... Oh, you got an invite from Bob. The legislature got an invite. Yes. Okay. He wants to talk to you. Yes, I'll reach out to Bob tomorrow. But I, I really, enough uh, with the information that's coming out that Mike just alluded to, that the select board should at least be versed of what's going on. Yeah. I would advocate for that. Mm -hmm. And and of course, it's too late to warn that maybe the. Well, it's well, not necessarily town Wednesday. business. You said Wednesday at five. Yeah. Uh, no, I just I just warned it like I like I do. Five thirty. Yeah. Yeah. Was yeah. it five thirty? No, I I'll, I can just drop a I put up a warning that um, majority of the select board will be there, but no business will be yeah. conducted. Same thing well, we do. I mean, for, we can't be there. Yeah, I'm I'm doing it. Heather's not here, so well, this is just Mr. Right. No, I'm actually um, can't be here. I'm, I'm a, doing a presentation at the library, so so we won't have a, a you you won't have to worry about we don't have a quorum, no. so you go. <laughs> I could go. I have a meeting at 5 30 that night. So we'll, we'll scratch that topic. Yeah, yeah. The legislators' meeting with Springfield Hospital on Wednesday and then next uh, November 8th. October, uh, October 8th, they're meeting uh, with the, the health medical health. Yeah. Center. Okay. Do I, um, do I need to warn that? Is there going to be a majority? majority of the board I, October I'm 8th? going. October 8th? No. Okay. Yeah. I'm going. I'm yeah. yeah, so I'll, so I'll let you know, I'll say the majority of the board uh, will be there, but there's no action being taken. Yeah. Need to be there. Okay, committee reports and announcements. Uh, on my left, Mike. Yeah. yeah, so the ordinance, ordinance, committee, committee. ordinance committee is going to meet on Thursday here in this very room, 2.30 in the afternoon. And... Um, it sounds to me like we're going to solve the housing problem in Springfield. Thank you. Um, <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> sure. Uh, we have an agenda, and the agenda includes a number of items that are open items that we uh, uh, are working on with the town manager. There is uh, a need to update the rates that we charge for zoning and building permits, and that's a... Um, that's a legislative responsibility of the select board. So the ordinance committee will set it first, then we'll make a recommendation to the board. Um, the uh, uh, ordinance municipal code includes some items related to uh, water and sewer that need to be updated to current practices and federal guidelines. However, I'm not sure that we'll be discussing that on Thursday, but it might be a preliminary discussion. Um, we also have some discrepancies between our our municipal code and our uh, our code now includes our, our our land use planning, which used to be called the uh, zoning bylaws. They've been incorporated together, so we've got sign discrepancies throughout the code that we need to resolve. But I don't think we're going to take that up on Thursday. But we'll start the discussion on that as well. I think Thursday's discussion is going to be. Um, Zoning and building permit rates and getting those in line with the, is Heather back on? Yes. Um, yes, she is. That's why we moved it from Wednesday to Thursday. It was Wednesday and moved to Thursday. Yeah, so. uh, we'll back to that. so that's our agenda. Yeah, the water water server will will be just to discuss the need, yeah. not to, yeah. and let you know what the resources are. So start yeah, the and, and you know, as it's too bad the rest of the people weren't here. They are certainly invited to come to the the meeting and they can see how laws are created and be part of the process. You said that you had, you had the agenda. Have you sent it out? No, I gave it to you. You were going to send it out. Okay. It was that list that I sent along with the minutes. The okay. Meeting. Yeah. All right. My committee reports. My committee reports are included in the uh, normal. I don't have any this this week or this meeting for. Uh, Transportation Advisory Committee or uh, SRDC. No, but you do have a, there's a stair meeting on Thursday, Thursday 5 30. I'm sure we'll hear more on that. I've already seen the agenda, so yeah. yeah. Um, Tara. I have no updates. So. Mike Schmidt? Uh, no, both of mine, um, and I will have reports. So. Very good. 
Um, the select board and their packets also received other minutes and correspondences, and that includes the Springfield Public Works Water System Division Report for August, Springfield on the Move minutes of July 18th, Springfield Town Library Finance and Audit Committee minutes of September 9th, and Springfield Town Library Trustees minutes of September 11th. They're available on the website. Card copies can be retrieved in the town manager's office, and the select board does receive those copies in our packet. Moving on to the point of the agenda where we have citizens' comments. I'll go with in-house if we have any. All set. Well, thanks for your participation this evening. Comments from uh, Jules Ogwin. Hi, thank you. Um, I have a question and a suggestion. Um, I was wondering if the gentleman who lives at the end of Front Street um, had asked anyone about having a dumpster placed in the middle of the road, and I was wondering if the town could perhaps lend him some traffic cones so it was more visible at night. Um, the gentleman that lives at the end of Front Street did pass that through the Planning Commission, and I am in compliance with the Planning Commission's instructions. All right. So he's doing construction there, correct? Or, or uh, the dumpster was requested to be removed today. Um, so we're just waiting for Alba to come and pick it up. All right. Cool. And police and fire have also been informed. And your second, was it a question or the comment second? No, I was just going to ask if the town could lend him some cones so they could be more visible at night. But if it's being picked up tomorrow, it's a non-issue. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Others that want to speak this evening? Really? You haven't spoken like? No. Um, I just want to remind people that we have a, our public hearing. It was in this week's shopper. Um, we have a public hearing on the one way street oh, ordinance. Wall street. Um, for, well, Wall Street, but we're also um, correcting that whole ordinance because it was very awkwardly worded previously. Um, but we have a public hearing on that at 6 o'clock on October 14th. Indigenous Peoples Day? Isn't October 14th? Indigenous it's actually, Day? Well, the 12th is actually today. It's the holiday celebrated. Observed. Observed. Yes. Observed. Yes. Yes. Okay. Can I say Indigenous people? Indigenous people. Thanks. Um, Steve, any comments this evening? No, but I will support Terrence's idea about putting that sign up by the lake by Riverside. Yeah, funded by the school. Funded by the school. I think yeah. there's grants available. No. Yeah, what would what, what Jessica say the cost? Was it six thousand or nothing? No, they, no. They got, those wigwags don't won't work there. No. You need to have the speed the signs like you'd have up at um, Union Street, and that's it's nineteen thousand for a pair. Um, we, we have gotten dinged on that location previously uh, with the crossing guard uh, is there lines not painted soon enough and school opens up and mm -hmm. it's it's a nasty corner to start with. And speed limit is 35, but we know we know that it gets abused. Mm -hmm. Especially family. I remember the school zones having a, a, a blinking light that says 25 miles an hour wind flash. Yeah. Yeah. Those all cost $19,000. I can send you the estimate I got. For sure. Yep. Jack, uh, are those some of the ones that are up on Union Street by Union Street School? Yeah. Is there something that maybe the police department can get through highway safety? Yeah. Yeah. Great one on Cherry I think, Hill I think too. actually the police department <laughs> had a safety one for the ones at Union Street School. Yeah. Uh, that was you, right? That was me. Yeah. That's why I wanted my plan yeah. was to do it to the schools. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We had a, a converted one before Riverside, but I see it's been taken down, so I don't know what happened to it. No function or what. Mm. All right. I don't see any more citizens' comments. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn since you don't have anything more to say. I move that we adjourn. <laughs> <laughs>
We do have a motion to adjourn and seconded. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those folks stay longer. <laughs> Jeff, did you say? What time do you have? 923? Yep. 923. Okay. Next.